Welcome back once again to Kevin Pollock's Chat Show. I am, as always, and shockingly, Chat Show. How are you? Mm. Uh, but just back from Baltimore, and I just want to thank all the uh, Baltimoreans. Uh, yeah, which, which one did I grab? Guest. I got the guest one. <laughs> Our guest looked at the bottom of his cup saying, I think you got the wrong cup there, Slammy. Speaking of Slammy, where's Sammy? Sammy Levine, fast Sam Levine. Got a job. Been re- the Jew has been replaced by an Arab. Oh. And if we can't find peace in the Middle East after today's show, who can? We should. We represent each. Right? Jason Antoon, thank you for joining us. Of course. I love being here. Uh-huh. You like to look over Jamie's shoulder and read what's going on in the window? Aww. With the chat. You want to make out with the visitors? No. <laughs> you're showing me baby pictures, and now you're like, let's make out. Um, <laughs> Jamie, you have much to report, no? No, not okay, really. Good. I'm boring <laughs> this week. Uh, I've been my week has been consumed. I'm trying to rewatch all of Mad Men before it starts. You're gearing up. When does um, this week in Mad Men begin? I believe we want to start the 19th, which is the week prior, the uh, Monday prior. Yeah, it is. It's a week from tomorrow. Turns out yes. Don Draper's a cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is the reveal in, ep- in season five. Turns out he's a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Will Don Draper get laid? That's the question this season. Um, so a week from tomorrow starts this week in Mad Men, a little pre so. yes, before the do. thing debuts on uh, the 25th of March. We're very don't excited. For you. He's a bad guy. <laughs> yeah, don't root for him. Um, J Mac wrote a joke that I did in Baltimore, <laughs> and it went over very, very well. Wow, what is it? Although I found that the rhythm of it, because I don't really do jokes, the rhythm of it was kind of Carson like. Yeah, tell me about As we all know. <laughs> As we all know, uh, Schnooky, that's right, Schnooky, the adorable drunk meatball from Jersey Shore is pregnant. She's, uh, she stated that her drinking days are over. That's right, her drinking days are over, and adding, my life has changed completely. She also announced a line of Ed Hardy onesies. <laughs> <laughs> life has changed forever. Anyway, it's a kill, so th- in, in Baltimore, so thank you, uh, J-Mac, for that, uh, that fun, <laughs> silly joke. And then the audience stared at me saying, you've been telling stories for a half hour. Why are you doing jokes now? <laughs> no, I didn't. Did you get him his ham sandwich? Uh, the ham sandwich comes later. Okay. Stretch your face. Uh, okay. Uh, I also wanted to um, well, thank all the staff and the great folks at Magoobies, easily the worst name of a theater comedy place on the planet. Magoobies. Dana Gould uh, was here, and he chatted, and I always give him credit for naming the, the funniest fake comedy club name, which I believe was Uncle Fucker's Chuckle Hutch. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. And Magoobies comes close to Uncle Fucker's Chuckle Hutch. Oh, it's, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Magoobies Joke House. It's probably next door to Uncle Fucker's. <laughs> yeah. Down the street from the competition, Uncle Fucker's Chuckle Hutch. I'm just going to do this for the rest of the show. Um, a big news uh, in, in these here parts with the, uh, <laughs> with the, with the podcasting. I believe I mentioned uh, last week when uh, David Wayne was here that we were launching a new uh, comedy podcast called uh, Talk and Walkin'. And uh, we're 14 days into this as of yesterday, and we cracked the top 10 after about five or six days, and then two days ago we landed at number three of all comedy podcasts. So I thank you, you sons of bitches. Uh, you just go to Talk and Walkin' on iTunes, and I change the spelling on Walkin' to match Talkin', because I don't want Walkin' family to sue me. So, I-N-I-N. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Talk and walk and I-N-I-N. <laughs> Who said that? What? Um, or go to talkandwalkin.com. But uh, Jason Antoon, you, you joined me for the third one. I did. It was very fun. Matt Myra did the first. I did the second one live from Caroline's on Broadway, New York with Rory Albanese. And uh, speaking of Mad Men, uh, Rich Sommer who plays Harry Crane. And then you joined me for the third yeah, one. Yeah, and you kept telling me I'm swallowing this big black microphone that was in front of my face the whole time. And I kept wanting to do this. And you're like, ease off the microphone. You were riding it like a jockey oh, I was on Seabiscuit. Like a jockey. Oh. But it was very fun. It was because I, you know, as, you're, as you continue to chat with you, as you're doing He Who Shall Not Be Named. No, I just speak as Christopher Walken the entire time. There's, okay. there's no secret. I just but don't it, want his family so, to assume. You it. end up thinking that you're with Walken because it's so casual because you're not doing. Yeah, I'm not doing know, bits. I'm you're, not, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not goosing it too much because you can goose it on the one liners when you're doing an impersonation of Chris. Like when I'm on stage. When you're on stage. Yeah. But here, when it's, it's long form, 
you got to sound a little more casual what you're doing, which is like... And we talk about nonsense. We ended nonsense. up talking about a friend of yours who ran for president in your high school and won because he promised to put doors on the bathroom stall. He promised to put <laughs> doors... That was his campaign, and he won. <laughs> his campaign was... And everyone was like, yes! Oh, my God! And it made me think, mm -hmm. or made Christopher Walken think, why are there never doors on bathroom stalls? Do they just never want you to shit at school? Is that the deal? Did you have doors on? Well, we'll, we'll get to that one. Well, the doors, <laughs> uh, like, so when you, you know, they had the walls, but no front no doors. No front doors. So you would, like, go into high school, and you're like, please don't <laughs> ever, no, anyone to come into the, please don't let anyone come in. Dr. Chen, the whole time you're afraid, so you would never go to the bathroom. No, no doors? No. Jamie? Any doors at Ambridge? Yes, we had doors on the Oh, maybe in the ladies' room. The ladies' room. I'll ask our guest as well when you, when, can't remember. when you're, yeah, <laughs> great. Great, that's helpful. I can't remember. Um, <laughs> uh, also, thanks uh, when you go to the iTunes for writing reviews. Appreciate that. You know that helps the whole thing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's get that crap out of the way. Um, and, you know, I don't want to forsake what's going on here. In fact, I realize there's only 19 reviews on the chat show, even though we're in the, the, the top 10 of the video uh, on iTunes. We need some more reviews, people. 19 after three years is not going to cut it. We're going to be three years old next week. Only everybody. 19 reviews? Yeah, I know. How fucking lame is that? I think they that? probably think that you don't need it. Oh, well, we do. It helps, damn it. So write some reviews about the chat show, even if they're shitty ones. Tell us what an ass we are and blah, blah, blah. Uh, we do ask you to get involved in the show constantly. Um, one of the ways we do that is to have you write in with how do you do the show? Do you, uh, do you watch us on the Hulu.com? You know, the whole library is on the Hulu.com now, and the iTunes and the website. So how do you how do, you do Kevin Pollan Chat Show? We hear, uh, oh, should we go to Ask Kevin first? Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> Let's go to Ask Kevin first, because I, I like the, uh, the graphic for Ask Kevin. Ask Kevin. Look at that. God. Everything's silly. Uh, this Ask Kevin comes to us from Scott Slaslow, because that's a fucking name. Having worked on many films, both good and not so good, thank you, what do you look for in a director? When you had Dana Carvey on, you both talked about a comedy you did in the 90s, I assume it was Clean Slate, and while you didn't name names, I got the impression that it was less than happy time, and that the director was more enthusiastic about the number of shots on the li shot list than working with you guys and having fun thoughts. Keep up the good work. Scott Slaslow, Boca Raton, Florida. Um, Mick Jackson was the director of Clean Slate, and uh, he did care a fuck of a lot more about how many shots he got in the day than, than the comedy we were attempting to do. I might as well call him out all the way. He directed The Bodyguard uh, yeah. with the late Whitney Houston. And Mick Jackson is so brilliant you know, that film is the number one selling soundtrack in the history of the motion picture business. Mick Jackson's cut two songs. Kevin Costner, true story, came in, recut the film, <laughs> put in nine more songs, and it became the number one best selling soundtrack in, in cinema history. That's a true fact. And sorry, Mick, you dick. I but worked with Mick Jackson. Did you? What you work with? an HBO movie called. Live from Baghdad that we shot. Oh, with Michael Cust Keaton. And with Michael Keaton, Helena Bonham Carter. I played an Iraqi with a must with a fake mustache. No, I Wait a minute. Iraqi. All we did was joke around the whole time. That the the entire shoot, I walked around like this because my mustache kept popping off because we kept. Because you actually are an Arab and you sweat too much. Yes, but I didn't want to grow a mustache <laughs> because, you know, mustaches don't look that great on some men. <laughs> I would look like. Khalil Gibran, and, but also slash terrorist rapist. <laughs> Never be able to get on a plane. <laughs> no. Never get on the plane. And this was back in the late 90s? No, this was 2002, right after 9-11. After Holy 9 shit. About, actually, closer to 9-11 when we shot the movie. And, uh, but Mick Jackson was there. And, and But did he direct it? He directed the movie. And much more consumed with how many shots in the, in the course of a day. I don't know. It was, was more handheld. Like, we're in, we're in, you know, we're supposed to be in Iraq, and it's supposed to be like, it was like this, that kind of Iraq shooting, so. I look forward to running into Mick and him taking a swing at me now that I mouthed off about him. What was Clean Slate about? Clean Slate was about uh, an hour and 40. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Oh, thank you for that. How do I do uh, Kevin Pollock's Chacha? This is from Amin B. The whole show is dedicated to the Middle East. Wow. When I'm at home, it's KPCS app on my boxy box, a podcast show on Apple TV, iTunes, Hulu add-on, 
XBMC. Do you know what the XBMC is, anybody? Somebody? Apple TV? When I'm on the road, I podcast the show from the iPhone iTunes. Oh, he watches the show on his, uh, on his telephone. Oh. Uh, there's an app coming your way for the iPad. Keep up the great show, Amin B. From Toronto, Canada. Told you we were international, you fuck. Sorry. Um, the last one is the Larry King game. I've uh, explained to our guest uh, at the end of the show there's a little Larry King game for him to do. But of course, you folks uh, watching or listening from around the planet, you know that if you write in a Larry King game, and I say it on the air, you get yourself a free t-shirt that you can walk around and advertise the fucking show by wearing. Uh, today's winner, Aaron Dalton. Congratulations, Aaron. And now, Aaron Dalton's Larry King game. <clears throat> you know, when you're on ecstasy, kissing Errol Flynn tastes like a mixture of sunshine and cheap Tabasco sauce. It was a simpler time. Look, Snort, Tennessee, you're on the air. That's all it takes <laughs> to get yourself a fucking t-shirt. Effort, people. Give it a go. Good job. Uh, write to us, tell us how you experienced the show. Are you watching us on the Hulu? We'd love to hear that, as would the people at Hulu. Um, so uh, let us know uh, how you do the show and ask your questions and, and offer up your Larry King games and we'll invite you into the, these hallowed walls. Um, Jamal, you're gonna, uh, oh, we've already got some uh, great offerings for our guests. I better bring them out here. Uh, Jay Mack, our wonderful research producer, sent me a 50 fucking two page dossier on today's guest, and I spent the entire Saturday reading, studying, and making these notes. Uh, I've known this man for a very, very long time, um, and uh, it wasn't until I went through this dossier that I became a little closer with my guest today, and his insane number of accomplishments, not accomplishments. We, we, most of us know several of his accomplishments, but it got a little ridiculous, quite frankly, if not obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> and I will just start with this one. Marching band. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Jamie, you were in the marching band, weren't you? Yes. And? Greatest shits alive? Well, I was a big, in my high school, it, we had a very large marching band and it was because we would take these trips uh, once a year where we would like leave for a week and like we were excused of everything. So, like, That's you didn't why you loved the marching yeah, band? Yeah, that was the best part. And football games were fun. And you played the? I played any percussion instrument that required note reading. So like the marimba or the xylophone or triangle, all that garbage. You and Miss Stoughton? Yes, my BFF, Jacqueline Stoughton. Mm -hmm. And she played the triangle? No, no, we played, in the marching band we had um, the xylophone. Oh, cool. That we like, it was like a But you loved it, yeah. come on, you've told me, you've confessed. Oh yeah, we it loved was, it. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Fun. All right, well I can't wait to hear it. I loved a con uh, Christmas time when you get to do concert, uh, concert band because I got to play the chimes, the giant chimes with the mallets. Oh wow. That was the fun. That would be that was awesome. Fun. Because those are very, very prominent in Christmas songs. Yeah, well, as a Jew, mm -hmm. I know that. Do the people yeah. in the band get laid? Do, do you find that? <laughs> not you, I'm not I'm trying to make it awkward, but I'm just saying. <laughs> when you're um, in the band, I was, you have a lot of... Are you asking my better there was half a lot of, There was a lot of... Uh, no, others. Nobody was getting oh. hand jobs on the way back from Disneyland, if that's what you're asking. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Turnabout and uh, Fair Play, something oh, along those me, lines we just witnessed. <laughs> All right. Now stop it, you two. Uh, so marching band, um, a PhD. Yeah, he's got a PhD. Honorary. Suck it. Honorary mm -hmm. indeed. Uh, I forgot about The that. Walk of Fame. Yeah. But the biggest achievement by far, and I can't wait to hear more about this, in his own words, the bobblehead doll from the Cleveland Indians. Please welcome Drew Carey. Hey, everybody. Tell me, sir, because I could tell by some of this that that bobblehead was, that was a big deal. Was a religious experience. That was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell I me. I think I'm the only non-athlete uh, in the Cleveland Indians history to get a bobblehead. <laughs> Long storied history. Yeah. Not to me well. Come on. I know they're all, you know, despite what you think of certain members of the Cleveland Indians, I'm the only <laughs> non-athlete. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> As it were. Yeah. But uh, where are you when you get this call and what the fuck? Uh, I think they called my publicist or my manager, sure. something like that. And Somebody said, called you. Yeah, and I said, yeah, that sounds good to me. And uh, so they sent me like drawings and artwork about the bobblehead, and I finally approved it. And then uh, went to Cleveland. They had bobblehead day, threw out the first pitch. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, you know, you, let's, let's back it. At, at the, the, I think the night before bobblehead day, I'm at 
the stadium, uh, watching the game, right. watching the Indians. I forget where they were playing. And uh, the weekend was going so good. My friend said, "Man, if the only thing that could happen that could be better is if you get a, a f foul ball hit right to you." And like the next inning, they hit a foul ball and it landed right in my lap. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> yeah. That's insane. I, I got up and I. I Your friend is it. the devil. I held it up and everybody applauded. And I threw it down to the fans down to the bottom. Right. I didn't keep it. <laughs> Let's be clear. I don't want to be a dick about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be greedy because I had the greatest day in the history of the Cleveland Indians organization. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Holy shit, man. Yeah. Um, oh, had you thrown out a first pitch before? Like you must have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty fun, though. The first time I threw out a first pitch, um, uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. Because you don't want to ground it. No. And I'm a really bad thrower, it turns out. Did you <laughs> of a baseball? Did you? I thought what Bill Murray did uh, was probably the smartest. What did he do for people who are concerned about grounding it and not throwing it did well? Did he just roll it? He did the wind up beautifully. Yeah. And then in his stretch, he turned to the side and did a beeline right into the stands. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. I like was a frozen no, I, rope right into the stands. I threw it to the dude. The yeah. uh, Jim. I forget who the catcher was. Jim Tomey was playing for the Indians at the time. The first time he was playing for the Indians, and. Um, they were all like doing their throwing around the infield and whatever. And uh, the, you know, Jim told me he said, you want to play catch with me? You know, before, I'm like, yeah, sure. So he would, I'd throw it to him. He was like over by first base and I was over by third base. So I, was, I would throw it to him and it would bounce and roll on the ground. Sure. Then he'd pick it up and he'd throw it back to me. And all I get, I, would, I heard this. Same. <laughs> I heard yeah. that. <laughs> then I, I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and I caught it and my hand like stung. And he wasn't even throwing it hard. No. My hand really stung, like for the rest of the day. And then the pitching coach came over to me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, do you want me to teach you how to throw like I teach the kids? Wow. And I went, yeah. And uh, he goes, well, you want to hit the giant, and there's, then there's a giant in back of you and a midget in front of you. What? And you want to hit the giant in the chin and hit the midget on the top of the head. Wow. And the I went like, oh, boom, boom. So you get that like a nice rotation. So that's what I thought of, and I practiced a couple times, and it really works. If you want kids at home, uh, yeah. if you learn giant anything midget. from today's show. Punch the giant in the chin. Giant the, in the giant, chin, and hit the midget, midget on top of the head. head. Which is, speaking of Vegas. And he gets a oh, sorry. nice rotation. And then I was able to throw it over the plate, and you know, it's nice. And then you reenacted this one night in Vegas it's as super, well. Super giant, hittable. The so. giant in the chin. Yeah. The midget on top of the head. Yeah. <laughs> that cost me a couple of bucks. <laughs> hey. money, money well spent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what money's for. Yeah. Uh, but it actually did create. Yeah, because yeah, I was doing this. Sure. Which is bad, like a catapult. Well, we're show you folk. Do a we're show folk. What do we know from? I don't you know. Yeah. I didn't play baseball. Uh, not even during the, the Marines? They didn't uh, sport you up I was little? in the reserves. Yeah, let's be clear. Yeah. I kept the commies out of Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you might have uh, you might have played a little baseball with the with, with the fellows at that. No, no. Well, I could I, th you know, I didn't throw it like in a baseball stadium from first to third, like with Jim Tomey was throwing. Like it didn't even curve. It didn't go, like it went straight. That's the astounding right thing. At also, me. It, it, when you try when you if you're anywhere near a professional sized diamond and you do try to throw from third to Huge. first. It, you, it's unfathomable. Well, like, where did this chasm come from? No, it's from? not like at the park, you know, where, <laughs> right. they, where you play softball. <laughs> yeah. It's big, man. Yeah. It, it seems, just seems like so huge. And then those guys are throwing it like, th it doesn't, there's no like rise and then it gets there like you no, think. No, like, like, like us. We do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, he was it's throwing it straight at me. Yeah, and, and all I, I could barely see it. And all I heard was, because I could hear it slicing through the air. That's crazy. It scared the shit out of me, man. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, I thought I was going to get hit in the face. Well, that's, that's what I was thinking when you said you catch it. I'm thinking, I might put my glove over here. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I don't want to. Well, you know, you want it to seem like kind of cool when you're catching it because everybody's watching, so you don't want to be like that. <laughs> no. But, no, you uh, don't. Scared the heck out of me, man. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. Uh, so, no, so I asked uh, Jamie about the marching band. How much fun was it for you? I love being a marching band. Right? I was a marching band in high school and then a little bit in college. Played the trumpet. Hell yes. Little yeah. trombone? No, just trumpet. Just trumpet. Yeah. No, what about Come on. trombone? What trumpet are we talking player. about? Yeah, <laughs> please. Why would I step down? <laughs> Trumpet's the king of the marching band. Who, uh, really? Trumpet, trumpet and percussion, and I would so, say, yeah. What inspiration did we Try doing? having a marching band without trumpets and percussion. Yeah, good luck can't with that. Can't do it. Right. <laughs> can't say, do it. You're saying you can get by without the xylophone? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, did you have any inspirations on, uh, when you were playing the trumpet? From, from the pro leagues of the trumpet playing? 
Mm, like Doc Severinsen was my hero always from The Tonight Show. And then once you got to do The Tonight Show and I actually got to meet Doc, how I was fucking, very excited. Yeah. Yeah. He was actually one of the coolest things about that show, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and a really good horn player, by the way. Amazing yeah. horn player. Yeah. Uh, so, but you actually were listening to him a bit when you were in high school. That's so cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when they came back from commercial, I tried to catch as much as I could. <laughs> 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 yeah. And that was it. <laughs> <laughs> was a fantastic seven notes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but once in a while they did let the band do a number. Yeah. Which was great when a guest didn't show up and they would right. let the band do a number. I figured that out later. Right. That was probably never planned that they let the band do the number. They were just, oh, so and so didn't show up. You know, well, you know, Couldn't I. Couldn't get anybody. So I know. The band do a number. Yeah. I always thought it was planned. It's ridiculous when you find these things out. Yeah. Um, I, well, let's, let's go all over the place and walk down the Carson Lane for just a second. We, we, we both experienced a moment in time. How, how old do you feel? You were, real, you were real, uh, instrumental in my Carson appearance, by the way. Say more. Uh, well, I don't know if you remember this, but I came out to visit you when you were in California. You were doing a sitcom. Forget the name of the sitcom. Uh, With Bob Saget was also on Full House at the same time. Right. And I came out, and I was playing at the... Uh, Ice House? Yeah. No, I was playing at the Comedy Magic Club down in Hermosa, Hermosa Beach. Beach. Right. Yeah. And I came to see your rehearsal. Paul Dooley, Glennis Johns, yeah. that one. Yeah. Come, coming of age, the retire yeah. retirement home. Yeah, the retirement yeah. home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he invited me to lunch, so we were in the... Like, commissary Universal? Commissary, and I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> Commissary <laughs> Universal. I was so excited. It was a big deal to me. And, uh, and I was like, oh, this is like the coolest thing. And uh, I asked you if you had any advice for doing The Tonight Show. And your advice to me was to go there before I do the show, and when the show's over, go out and stand on my mark. Right. So I'd be able to be in the environment and look around and see what it was like yeah. before this. That way I'm not freaked out when I walk out there and go, oh my God, there's the band, there's you know the desk. The, but I, it could be in my head ahead of time and get my, the nerves over with. So I called uh, The Tonight Show and I got, I think I saw you on Wednesday. So on Thursday, I went to see... Um, Macaulay or you went with some act? I went by myself and I went to The Tonight Show on Thursday night uh, and I watched the taping of the show, and um, Larry Miller was on, and Jerry Seinfeld was with him. He's like they're, sure. they're friends, so I remember Larry Miller is doing a set, and I'm backstage, and there's Jerry Seinfeld there, and I was like, oh my god, Jerry Seinfeld, and I'm like, hey, Drew Carey, I'm, I'm scheduled to do the show, you know, get one of these days, and I remember Jerry Seinfeld going, uh, yeah, this is what it's all about. Yeah, <laughs> Johnny Casual doing a set on the Tonight Show. Yeah, and he was right. Like Definitely. that's what it's like. What are we in the business for? <laughs> Right. If not to do a set of the Tonight yeah. Show. And uh, so that was real exciting. And then the next day, um, Friday, it was a really fun week. I was working at the Comedy Magic Club down at Hermosa Beach. So then I would drive down there. And then the next day, um, I was staying at a friend of mine's uh, named Matt King. He's a magician. And he does a daytime show in Vegas now, if you ever want to go see him. He's great. Yeah, it's really good. And you take the whole family. He does like a family-friendly daytime magic show in Vegas. Right on. So... Uh, I, I was staying at his place, and this is before cell phones or anything like that. So oh, hell yes it was. The only way to get it, I had an 800 number service that people could call me. Were you wearing a pager? Is that what you're telling me? No, it wasn't a pager. It was an 800 number, and then I would call from a pay phone and like hit pound, and I was able to put my box number in. And we are 105. Was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's how I got my message. So <laughs> I was staying at Matt King's, and uh, I was going to go see uh, Full House because I was also knew Bob Saget. Sure. So it was going to be my second big sitcom experience, but I was going to see an actual taping. In a week. Yeah, and the Beach Boys were on Full House. Jesus! Said, yeah. So I was going to be gone all day, so I took all my stuff with me, my, my suit, my toiletries, because I wasn't going to be able to go back. I was going to have to drive straight to the Comedy Magic Club. Saw the Full House taping, which, by the way, was kind of epic because the Beach Boys did all their, it was about the Deej didn't have tickets to the Beach Boys and they finally got them out of what happened. Help but me the, Gibbler. Yeah, however it, it happened. The, the, the song was Help Me Rhonda and she said, Help Me Gibbler. They're like, it's not Help Me Gibbler, it's Help Me Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs> My God, you remember the fucking episode. Oh, I, I know way too much about Full House and Mama's Family. That is awesome. <laughs> so get this, they did all the Beach Boys stuff first because they had to leave. Oh my so they God. taped it out of order and they taped all the Beach Boys stuff first. So you're watching them perform. And then, uh, so then they were going to do the, they did, they were going to do a, 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 what do you call it, a little commercial, you know, with the Beach Boys, and then they taped the rest of the show. It was a lot of order, yeah. They did a little promo. So all the Beach Boys, and Mike Love is holding one of the 
Olsen twins. Sure. They were like three at the time, okay. probably. Yeah. And what they would do is they would have a dialogue coach prompt the Olsen twin for what to say. Right. Because obviously too young to read. Yeah. So they just say they would say the line and the Olsen twin would repeat it. They were so monkeys Mike, at that point. Yeah. So Mike Love's holding one of the Olsen twins. All the Beach Boys are there. And uh, hi, Mike Love of the Beach Boys. Be sure to watch us on Full House this Wednesday at 8 o'clock on ABC. And the dialogue coach creeps up and he goes, say hi, Beach Boys. And Brian Wilson goes, hi, Beach Boys. <laughs> 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 that is fantastic. <laughs> And everybody like laughs like ha ha oh uh. <laughs> like quiet all these laughs like ha ha oh and then they like stop everything and Mike loves like huh what to do and then they somebody goes talks to Brian Wilson and he goes oh uh. <laughs> you know and then they <laughs> do it again he doesn't say anything and then they do the rest of the show and then I head down to uh, Mosa because I'm the uh, opening act uh, I think I'm middling and they and uh, I get there and the MC meets me at the door and he goes, hey man, how you feeling? And I go, I'm feeling okay. I had a pretty good day. You know, it's Beach Boys. Yeah. Stuff. And it was pretty, I got a story to tell you. And uh, I go, what happened? He goes, oh, I don't want to tell you. And I go, did my mom die or something? Just tell me what happened. He goes, oh, but colley has been trying to call you all day to do the Tonight Show. To that, that night? Yeah. Couldn't get a hold of you, so we had like some other guy do it. <laughs> I can't remember the guy's name. Well, like, that was the thing back in those days. When you were on the list, when you're on the short right. list, you're like on a tarmac. Right. And there's no cell phone. There's no way to reach you. No way to reach me. Yeah. And, uh, but the, you got to be just around. And I was like, what the fuck? I can't believe, <laughs> you know, what? Damn it. Oh, you know, yeah. get him another time. And uh, so I got up on the stage that night. I even made a joke about I was supposed to do the Tonight Show tonight, but I missed the call. But here's my set. I did my Tonight Show set. Right. And then I did the rest of the show. And uh, when I got home, I was able to listen to the messages on Matt King's machine for me. How many from McCauley? From uh, Jeff Schneider. Oh. The guy was comedy club owner and he was trying to get a hold of me because Macaulay called him. Hey, Drew, it's Jeff. Hey, real exciting news. Uh, Macaulay's trying to get a hold of you to the Tonight Show tonight. Give me a call back. Blah, blah, blah. Beep. Hey, Drew, it's Jeff. What the fuck? Yeah, gotta call me back. I uh, <laughs> got a couple hours. Uh, Macaulay call. Wants to do the night show. Beep. Drew, it's Jeff. Really important. You gotta call me back in an hour. And then beep. Hey, Drew, it's Jeff. You blew it, man. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That was the line of you. You blew it, man. <laughs> yeah. You know, next time, but yeah, it's too late. <laughs> you know, I remember, I'll never forget that. Hey, Drew, it's Jeff. Uh, you blew it, man. <laughs> So then I call Macaulay, this up Friday, I call Macaulay on Monday, and I, Jim Macaulay was the guy that picked all the comics for the Tonight Show, and yeah. like, when he was in a club, everybody tightened up. He was know? the gatekeeper. Yeah, he was the total gatekeeper for stand-ups getting on the Tonight Show. And uh, I called him, I said, hey, I'm sorry, I missed your call. Uh, you know, I tell you what scares me again. Yeah. And he said, uh, well, I'm sorry I missed the call, but I'd like, he only seen, he's only, he'd only seen me once. Jesus. And I got booked my first time. I ever auditioned for okay. him, which is also very unusual. One through a hundred, that never happens. Never happens, never. yeah. And uh, usually people audition like five times, 20 well, times. Also, so, he would so, circle you, because you needed to have two shots ready. Because if you killed that first one, he knew Johnny might say, you bring that kid back in two weeks. So the fact that he, after one viewing, said, yeah. you're ready. And I didn't been doing comedy like three years or something when he took me. It was like, I was so brand new. And he said, well, I'd like to see you again before I book you again. Oh, no. And I was like, all right. And my act had changed so much. He oh. saw me, like, back in May, and this was November. Oy. And I was in my third year, two and a half years. I mean, like, my act had changed dramatically in that year. And so you're thinking, he's going to see me, and it's not going to happen. Well, I, I thought, well, yeah, I'll go see him again. So I did my act again for him, and he didn't like me then. Seriously? Yeah, then he didn't like it. So you were booked. Yeah. Demoted. Right. But the only reason that he saw me or they wanted to call me in the first place because I went there on your advice because you said, hey, you should go there. So he knew I was there <laughs> that Thursday. Oh, no. Because Kevin Pollock told me I should come and do the Tonight Show. <laughs> you just happened to be in the building. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and he, I was fresh in his mind. He go, oh, Drew Carey's here. Let's oh, use I him he's so, in, while he's in town. Oh, God. But I went there because of you. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Because you told me to go there. But it was good advice because then when I finally did get to do the show, I'd know, I remembered what it was like to go out there, and I, it really worked. I wasn't as nervous. Well, this was, had been passed down to me by either Shandling or Seinfeld. I was, was able to, I was able to visualize it in my head. Yeah. 
like very clearly, and I had I had kind of like a vision of it the night before I did. Even just to find out how short the distance was between Doc's band and Johnny's desk, because mm -hmm. on TV it looks like it's a half a mile apart, and you yeah, get yeah. there and it's 14 feet, and you go, what the fuck happened to the studio? Yeah, seriously, like five steps and you're at the desk. <laughs> right? Not even. Um, it's amazing that you shared all that, because uh, what I wanted to get to was a bit of the story that a lot of people do know, because it was such a huge, gigantic deal at the time. You may know the exact number of comedians that had been what was called in its day spontaneously paneled prior to you. But didn't that in fact happen on your very first Yeah, panel? I got called over the couch my very first time. It was called spontaneously paneled by the comedians. They was gave it? they gave it that moniker. I because never it had happened to Roseanne, it had happened to Ellen. Ellen after you or before you? And before me. Yeah. But maybe like three times only or five maybe. I was in the basement of the Cleveland Comedy Club waiting to go on and I saw Ellen get called over. Yeah, the yeah. spontaneously panelled. Yeah. But it was legendary. Yeah, it was a big deal. For stand-ups? If you name the people that got called over the couch the first time, you would name people with their, all their own sitcoms that became stars. Seriously? Though. Yeah. There's not one person on that list that somehow vanished, that somehow no. slipped through. No. That's another proof uh, of Carson's genius and his no. why he was one of a kind. Did you, did, um... I will tell you a funny story. Yeah, like, please. Because you're talking about people that slipped through, you know, I did HBO Young Comedians. Right. Like, the next time I auditioned for Macaulay was, like, three years later. No. Yeah, about. And I auditioned for him again, and I got the show, but the, and I really killed it. By that time, I was just, like, a total headliner. Yeah. Really had my stuff together. And I was totally, I, would, I wasn't really ready. Maybe to a blessing. Before. It was a blessing. And, um... But when I auditioned for him, the HBO and Comedians people were in the audience at the same night at the improv. So I got both shows on the same audition. Crazy. Yeah, I know. But so I did HBO and Comedians, and I was with John Stewart, who was on the show with me. Right. We were HBO and Comedians together. Uh huh. And we were looking at the, we got a hold of a list of everybody who'd been on HBO and Comedians before us. You know, uh, Kinnison and Elaine Boozler and, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was, you know, Jay Leno, Lane Booth, like all these people that become famous. But on every single show, there was, there was one or two people where, where it's not only we didn't wonder what happened to them, but we never heard of them. Like there was a, like from the first couple of years, there was like an act like, fuck are they? Yeah. It wasn't like, <laughs> what happened to them? Like, who the fuck are they? <laughs> never, never ever heard of them. Right? Yeah, and me and John Stewart, I'll never, I'll never forget, we were backstage, like at a stairwell of this theater, like looking at this list and, and going like, oh my God, who's that? Who's that? And we looked at each other, we were like, Let's not be that person. Yeah. <laughs> Which one of us is going to be? And we shook hands. We were like, whatever happens to us, it could be a what happened to him, but not who the fuck is that. You know what I mean? We right. could burn out, but let's not be like never noticed. Yeah. Ever. It seems like things worked out for both of you. And yeah, I'll never forget that, though, because I, I really like bonded with them during that taping. Yeah. And we were like, please, God, let's not be that one guy. <laughs> right. That what a act. strange thing to bond over. Yeah. Um, that was weird. So you were you were called up to do the show, and then three years later, when yeah, you were actually like, ready, three years to the month, I was ready to, and then I, I got finally got the show. I auditioned again, and I get the, like three Novembers later, I was on the show. How much did it haunt you during those three years? In terms, it's of all I thought about. <sighs> That's a long fucking time. That's all I thought about. I even actually uh, I moved out to L.A. with a girlfriend. Did you hate the Beach Boys and Saget at that point? No, <laughs> no. Uh, although I did not. I, every time I heard the Beach Boys, I thought of it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Which is like, I stayed away from AM radio. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I came out, uh, I was living in Cleveland. I, I had a girlfriend then, and I was like, we got to move to L.A. I'm right. not going to have this. This isn't going to happen to me again. Right. It's too sketchy. You know, i got to get to the Tonight Show. I was like, it was this close. So I moved, you know, we came out to LA and with had nothing. Nothing. I had yeah. money troubles. I was gone for like three months, three weeks out of the month. Doing the road. Doing the road. And we broke up. And then it was a horrible breakup, a lot of tears. And I ended up like, because uh, we talked about getting married and stuff, you know, it was yeah. really a serious relationship. And then uh, I lived out of my car for uh, 18 months. I didn't sleep in the car, but I drove everywhere around the car, gig to gig. I was never in one place more than a week for 18 months. And the whole time, I was thinking, like, i got to get better so I can do the Tonight Show. I ran into you during those times. Every, every act, every night was, i got to get good so I can do the Tonight Show. Yeah. That's all I thought about. So that, that year and a half there, plus the, you know, it was a half year to get over it, you know, another year moving out there, then a year and a half living out of my, or, you know, living out of my car, another half year, you know, before I got, after the audition to actually get on the show. Right. You know, I mean, it was like... Uh, that's all I thought about. That it's was hard the, to explain 
to uh, anybody in their late 20s or early 30s that, that what you just described was the center of the universe for a stand-up comedian. Yeah, if you had a lottery ticket and it blew away, <laughs> right. and you were like, I gotta find that lottery right. ticket. Yeah. That's what it was like. Yeah. I gotta fuck, that's my whole, that's a, my the, whole career is there. The fact that there was a show, and by the way, as it turns out, you were right. Yeah. That first <laughs> appearance with him and him seating you down. I made my whole career. That literally the next morning. I was in show business. Did you just sit by the phone? Uh, no, at the, my, I, I'd signed with Rick Messina by then. Lucky. Uh, I, but I already got, but the thing is, I already got the show. Like I already auditioned and got the show. Right. And I was approved again to do the show. And right. then I signed with Messina. Right. So he didn't get me the show, I got the show. Yes. The, uh, he got all the, the benefits. Yeah, you could say that. But I remember even Messina sat me down and he goes, uh, he said, hey, uh, we got this client, Tim Allen, do you, know, do you know who he is? And I go, yeah, I heard of him, because I'd seen his picture up in comedy clubs. And he goes, sure. well, he just did a pilot. And if the pilot goes, we're gonna hire, uh, we're gonna assign another client. We'd like that to be you. And uh, I was like, all right. And I never, you know, I didn't know, then Tim, that was home improvement. And that went, that went really well <laughs> for Tim Allen. <laughs> 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 Made him a couple bucks. Yeah. And uh, then, so they signed me after that. And then it was like, um, and then I did the Tonight Show. Then like the next, that whole week, I did a Tonight Show on a Friday. It was perfect. It's just how you had to be on a Friday because that's the biggest viewing day. And then they have the weekend to try to. And then you also want. I also want to be on, on with Johnny Ed and Doc. I didn't want to substitute right. anybody. Right. I, you don't want to guess. I don't want Tommy. Sorry, I didn't even want Tommy Newsom. Yeah, I right. love Tommy Newsom. <laughs> but I, I wanted everybody I watched when I was a kid. Yeah. To be there. Yeah. And that's just how it worked out. And uh, then Monday, like it was just. That's all they did at the office was answer calls about me and send out packets. Yeah. And like, I remember walking in there, just like piles and piles of packets they were sending out. And, um, uh, it was an absurd time. Yeah, it was absurd. And then I had, like, I did sets at the improv every night that week. And you were basically back. broke at this time. It's I wasn't broke. I mean, you were, you were getting money on the road. I was getting road money. I wasn't broke. Right. Okay. You know, I was making. A, I didn't have any money in the bank. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, and I had, that, that's what I should have said. Yeah, you didn't I, have any money in the bank at the time, right? Yeah, I was living. You know, but I, I was making like I think I was making like seventy, eighty grand a year. But well, wait a second. That's a fa <laughs> you couldn't pocket any of that. I was blown. Oh, are you kidding me? I was a comic on the road. I was spending money. <laughs> How much Denny's is? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. We, and I room? know it was one of your favorite places. So I'm shocked you know, that you couldn't uh, hold on to 80 grand. Well, I mean, I, I had like a bunch of student loans and stuff. That You've were, got agents and managers taking right off the top. Yeah. You know. I'm yeah. not, but you, you were saying about 10 grand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was spending a lot of money. Um, so I, uh, I remember I had 23 uh, William Morris agents show up at the, at the improv to see me do a set one night. Jesus. And they, we sat up in the top there, and then they all sat and once, like, facing me, and I sat here, and they stayed for, like, an hour after I did my set talking to me about what they would do to, for me. And 23 of them? Yeah, I'll never forget it. Three would have been overkill. No, they had the head of the lit, the head of the commercial department, the head of the... They wanted you back. Movie department. Yeah. I didn't sign with them. I don't know if they were <laughs> but I, I signed with Marty Klein. Uh, he came by himself, and he was so—he was like such a sincere. So, so was William Morris. I got nothing bad to say about him, but the, um, it was like crazy. But that was how it was every single night. It wasn't like an agent. Coming yeah, up. that's what like, I was it saying. Was Marty Klein, yeah. and it was like twenty-three William Morris agents, the head of every department, right. and it was like it was really like the craziest week of my life. Well, that's why I was trying to stress that it was a moment in time that you, it's difficult to explain to someone who is looking at the scene today of late night talk shows. They can't really fathom that one appearance created all of that. Yeah, It doesn't minutes. make sense today. Seven minutes of my life. Right? And I was probably never funnier than that seven <laughs> minutes. Well, you haven't been as funny I since. Picked, I picked a good time to be funny. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? You picked a good night. Yeah. If, a I moment. Gonna, if I was gonna be funny, that was the time. That, yeah, that was the time not to fuck it up. Yeah. Holy crap. I tell everybody I've done, in other interviews, and I'm totally serious, it was like, I used to belong to a Pentecostal church when I was in junior high. Right. And uh, it was like the closest thing to like a, that was like a come to Jesus. I remember when I got saved, when I was in the Pentecostal church, where you speak in tongues, you roll around, it was the Somebody God church. Speaking tongues, roll around on the ground, and all that stuff. And that Tonight Show appearance was like the closest thing I've ever come to that right. feeling. Where you just like, the Holy Spirit's in me, I'm, something's happening special today. Like that feeling where like, oh, my life's changed forever now, yeah. and my whole, 
you know, like when people have a baby that happens, or you know what I mean, where you're like, sure. oh, something's happened in my psyche where I'm not gonna be the same person ever again right. from this moment on. Right. And that's what happened when I did The Tonight Show. It was really crazy. And some of the research suggests that you're starting to witness that or have been witnessing that at The Price is Right in terms of how these people are cheering for total strangers, how they're rooting for each other and they have no vested interest, and how they go absolutely apeshit when you... Yeah, I feel that like churchy stuff at Price is Right all the time. Because right? it's, it's really like, uh, yeah, people are always like... There's, it's just what you see on TV. Every, there's no, like, a commercial, we have people that do this, like here the commercials come in, but people generally are just going batshit, you know? And they're really, like, there's total strangers, and that's the greatest thing. Like, you never get a situation where so many people are rooting for a stranger to do well. Right. You never. You would think it would breed competition, a situation does like not. that. Everybody yeah. does not. Everybody's so happy for whoever wins. Right. Like, even the dollar bidders don't get mad, really. Like you bid 400, they bid 401. Right. Even they're like, uh, you know, it's part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So they can't really get mad. Right. They're disappointed, but they're not mad ever. Right. And uh, there, it's so much joy and happiness. And then you get this wave of it. And when you walk out, this like this big wave of happy. Yeah. Comes at you, and then you're in it, swirling around you, all this happiness, like for an hour, and then... I'm sure at first there was no way to prepare for that part of it. Nothing. It was like a sound. It was like, honestly, like you could feel all the particles of happiness just surround you, like in a, like in a movie uh, FX, you right. know what I mean? Like, a, like an effect in a movie, just right. like swirling around. And then, um, then I get a two-hour lunch, and I come back for the afternoon show, another thing of happy, and I go home, and I'm like, man, it, was like, it feels so good when you get off stage there. It's like really fantastic. And then everybody is just like so... Freaking happy, and I tell the um, like I get like all the contestants are like I feel like I could be friends with every single contestant. How freaky is that? Yeah, and uh, it's as if they're selecting because I like people that are upbeat. Yeah. Anyway, I like people that are upbeat and happy all the time. Well, it's anyway. kind of how you've been your whole life, as far as yeah. I've known. I like to be. I, I only want to be surrounded by people that are upbeat, happy, fun. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I like to be around. And so the contestants are like, oh my God, that, and like that guy could be my butt, my drinking buddy. Right. This old lady could be my neighbor. Right. She could be my nice neighbor. A cute chick, I could go out with her. So you you're know? casting the movie of your life when you're, when you're around. Yeah, but I meet everybody in the, in the thing. I'm like, ah, you know, that could be, if they weren't a contestant, we'd be friends right. somehow. Mm -hmm. Like we'd be the people that we had chat them, at least somebody that I chatted that I chat regularly with at the coffee counter I would moment. want to hang out with these people is what yeah, you're thinking on some kind of level yeah you know where you're like oh I could easily be friends with all these people right everybody that comes on the show and a lot of people in the audience don't get picked too yeah you know because they're all really like upbeat happy but that's an extraordinary part of it that I don't think anyone probably explained to you when they were talking to you about doing the show and not really I mean I, I've never heard there's a guy there's a producer when I first met them because I didn't want to do the show first right yeah, I read that initially. Yeah, I was like, I remember I was taking acting lessons at the time, and I thought, well, I like to do movies and stuff. And then um, I got a call from uh, my agent. I'll never forget. He goes, uh, I got that most interesting call from CBS Casting. And I was like, oh, maybe they want me to do a CSI or, you know what I mean? <laughs> so one of their big dramas. Want to be a killer. Yeah, like, uh, you know, like right away I'm like, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, he goes, uh, what would you think about uh, taking over for Bob Barker on The Price Right? And I was like, fucking no. And you son of a bitch. Like, no. Yeah. That old man show, that old person show that's on daytime, no. Yeah. Well, yeah. No. Especially where your head was at. Like, a two, like that was like a 10 second call. Well, really? Yeah. Like, if you're, he goes, really? Because they were seeing me like, no, forget it. Are you kidding me? I was like, poof, rah, rah, rah. Right. Then I, you know, I remember I was with the, uh, my girlfriend at the time, and we went to the, uh, we were at a driving trip, and I went, I, ch I checked my messages in the car, and I left my phone. And, uh, and there was a message waiting for us, I heard the message, and I got back, and I go, you can't believe it. Like, Bob Barker, I don't know, Price is right. I was like that when I sat down. They wanted you for, that'll be the day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. And then a couple weeks later, uh, th that's, I was, they, I got on their radar, because I was, I did a uh, pilot, for a show called Power 10. It was right. on, so that's, they saw the pilot. I was in New York doing the pilot and I was driving back. And uh, I like to drive. And uh, when I got back to LA, they picked up the show and then I got another call. 
The pink of the agent. power of 10. Yeah. yeah. And I got another call from my agent. I got, well, you know, I got another call from CBS Casting. And I was like, yeah. I wasn't as excited. To... <laughs> yeah, CSI. <got> it. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, you know, they're really after you to do this Price is Right thing. And I go, how much does it pay? Yeah. He goes, <laughs> that finally came out of <laughs> yeah. me. If go, I'm going to consider it, <laughs> yeah, I like, need to know how big the money truck is. Like, what, what kind of money are we talking about? And he, <laughs> yeah. goes, he goes, I have no idea. And I go, well, what, what are the taping hours? Like, what do they tape? He goes, I don't know. You don't know shit. You didn't know anything about it. <laughs> so I said, well, why don't you go do some due diligence. And then, so do your fucking job. Yeah, do your job. Get back to me. Before you call me. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, you know, so they would like to meet with you. And I thought, well, now I feel obligated to meet with them. Sure. Now, now you've inquired. Yeah, because they're asking again. And they picked up the Power 10. So I'm kind of in business with them. Is that a different network or the same? Same. Same, same CBS. Right. But, the, you know, now I'm in there. They have my nighttime show. It's so not kind of obligated to have a meeting with them. Yes, you are. You're in the family. Yeah. You're going to get a Christmas gift. So I met with, uh, uh, I, I met with them and um, uh, Barbara Bloom, uh, the head of daytime, who's the head of daytime there, who's not there anymore. And Nancy Tellum. Uh, yeah. Who else? Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? Okay. So I, <laughs> I sat down and they some executives. Yeah, it doesn't matter what anymore. But uh, the uh, it's just a few of them, and mm -hmm. I, I sat down and um, they uh, that it was after that meeting I decided I would do it. I needed I, based I, on what they said at the meeting. Well, I found out how much it would pay <laughs> at the meeting. No, yeah. no, of course not. For my agents and man, like they asked around, sure. and ha got an idea what Bob was getting. Right, and then uh, so I thought, ah, that's pretty good money. And uh, I was interested in buying into a soccer team. Jesus. So yeah. I thought, well, that could be my soccer money. Right. I really that's what I was thinking. I'd right. be soccer money. <laughs> like that's money I used to buy my to get into the team with. And uh, but it was a bit more of a commitment than that. Yeah, and then I had the meeting with him, and they were like, uh, I remember Sid Vintage, I have to give him credit, because he said to me, he goes, what do you like to do more than anything else? And I go, I like to leave big tips. It really gives me a thrill. And he goes, well, here, you'd be able to give away things every single day. Holy shit. And I was like, yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah. Every day I'll be giving away things. Yeah. And I kind of made up my mind then. I thought, well, let's do it if we can work it out. And when I, I went to dinner right after that and met my agent there. And uh, he goes, how'd it go? And I go, I think I'm going to do it. And he said to me, he goes, hey, there's your soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> and we shook hands. Wow. <laughs> and then I have, my family was in town, and I had sat down with my family, and they go, because, the, you know, there's, they were kind of rumored that I was going to be, right. that they were considering me by then. And they said, how'd it go? And I go, I think I'm going to do it. They're going to be the host. And then your family said, there's your soccer team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never told that before. That was my agent actually said that, there's your soccer team. And I, we shook hands. I go, yeah. Yeah. There's my soccer team. It's one of those crazy moments in time as well. Because they said that, you know, they were real, talked about the hour, like the hours were flexible and I could, you know. How many in a day? I take two a day, three days. Oh, I hate to say, people are going to want to kill me. I take, tape. Well, uh, listen, it's 15 minutes internet. ago you said you set 80,000 a year on fire. So, you know. Yeah, it's, in, it's and they're already it's, not happy. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> if they're going to cast aspersions, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you've already. Um, <laughs> You know, I got to pay airfare out of that. Yeah, you know, that's a lot. <laughs> and stuff. I've got hotel expenses, people. <laughs> I'm not literally sending. That's uh, my gross. That's yeah. Not what I took home. It is funny when you first try to have that conversation with your family about what you actually see. It starts to make sense that Elvis held on to like 10% of his yeah, money. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know? You don't see any of it. Uh, There's a but, pie chart, and I'm the little piece of sliver. Yeah, yeah I swear. Uh, but they. Uh, Try telling that to the Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to hear it. Nope. Uh, yeah. So I, 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 I uh, it's two day, two shows a day. I go in about quarter to twelve. <laughs> you for shows at twelve twenty. Right. So I, I literally go. You show in, up thirty five minutes before. Yeah. I say hi to everybody. Change in my suit. Go to makeup. Walk on stage. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing to learn. It's the price is right. I know all the games. And, uh, yeah, when I walk out on that stage, it's, I've been there for, like, half hour sometimes. Or before? Yeah. Now. And then I, we take show takes, like, an hour 15, hour 20. It's pretty much. Right. You know, we're right on. They have to switch out the games. That's the only thing that takes time. And I talk to the crowd in between. So I'm on stage all the whole time. And then uh, I get a two-hour lunch. Just about. And then uh, tape another show at 4.10 or so. And then... You're I'm, probably sleeping during the two-hour lunch, though. I, I do phone calls. Reading, people. napping. Yeah. yeah. And then I... Because we uh, know you don't eat much now. Yeah, and then I... <laughs> so um, you're not having a two-hour lunch. Yeah. <laughs> and then I uh, 
do the second show, and then I'm dressed and out the door, makeup washed off and everything by six o'clock. So, I'm about a six hour day. Noon till six. So, about a six and a half hour day. Three days a week. With a two hour lunch. Three buys days a week. That's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Buys you a soccer team. And then uh, I got to do three weeks on and one week off. Oh, fuck. And sometimes I get two weeks off. Christmas, I get three. And then if I, <sighs> like, when the World Cup was going on, the Germany World Cup and this, or the South Africa World Cup was going on, I said, uh, you know, I need a month off to right. go to South Africa, and I got a month off. And they said, we have A-Runs. Yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty easy job. How old were you when the soccer thing happened? When I had interest in the soccer? Yeah. I was living in L.A., and uh, I'm from Cleveland, so I can't root for any L.A. teams. I mean, I wouldn't. I'm not going to become a Lakers fan all of a sudden, for example. I'm with you. I'm from San Francisco. I hate everything else. You're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Can't do it. And uh, so I don't even like wearing like Dodgers hats or anything. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't even wear... like seeing a Dodgers hat. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to wear one. That's never going to happen. Yeah, from San Francisco especially. Even when yeah. my Giants come to town, I don't go to Dodger Stadium. I won't go in that fucking place. Yeah, right. We went. Because then you got to give them money and buy, when you buy a hot dog. Exactly. Right. Dodger blue. <laughs> yeah. And then they killed one of my people or yeah, tried to. Yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, you don't want to go there. So uh, I, I, I was like, man, I miss going to games, you know, just because in Cleveland I would just like up and go to a game one day. We got a sure. wild hair up my butt to go to a game and I could just go and root for them. And I'd read the paper and there'd be articles about my team, you know, and I, there's nothing in the LA Times about a Cleveland team. No, it's shocking. I got to go online. It's just nothing. And bug me. So I thought, well, I got to find something to root for out here. And uh, the LA Galaxy, which is the local MLS soccer team here, uh, David Beckham plays for him. He, uh, they just started at the Home Depot Center, and there, there was articles about this new place they were moving into, and I was like, oh, maybe we should go check out soccer. Maybe that could be my thing here, because there's no soccer team in Cleveland. There's so no you way. thought of this? Yeah, I got, there's no way anybody in Cleveland get mad at me for liking soccer, because they don't even have a team. Right. Maybe I could just follow the local soccer team here, and that way I can have a team to follow, and I can go to the games, and have somebody root for locally. I could have that experience. That speaks also volumes, I think, to just what a uh, in your gut, fan of sports in general. I like sports. Yeah, yeah, and I miss the experience. You don't want to, you know. I like to go to game. Yeah, and uh, so I went to the. I took my girlfriend at the time. We went out to uh, Galaxy game, and it was great. Pre Beckham. Pre Beckham. Yeah, there was no, nothing happening. It was they just moved into the Home Depot Center, but it's a great place to see a game. Uh, really great stadium, and holds about twenty five thousand somewhere around there, and uh, really good experience. I thought, wow, this is really fun. Never saw a live soccer game before, and then. Uh, I mean, I, would, I didn't know anything. I was asking, like, what an offside rule was, sure. what the penalty kick was all about, you know, how many minutes and a half, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then I started buying, like, when I bought, like, Soccer for Dummies and all, like, every tape and DVD I could find about the history of. And I learned as much as I could about soccer. And then I found out that the, and I was kind of retired at the time, too, so I didn't have a job. And I found out that the men's national team was just starting to qualify for the World Cup and the Germany, the German World Cup, and they were going to be playing at all these different places around the world. And I thought, oh my God, I should, call, I should follow the national team. That'd be my excuse to travel. And I could it's go a pretty on a, great excuse. Yeah, so I, the first time I saw the national team play, I was in Trinidad, and I went to, it was right after Super Bowl, and I went to Trinidad to see him play, and they just was, were finishing up Carnival, so I, I got there on uh, Tuesday night for the end of Carnival, and Wednesday, the game was on Ash Wednesday. Oh my God, I mean, it's, it's I mean, already it a great. religious experience for them in Trinidad, I would think, compared to what you're seeing in Los they love, Angeles. They, they, they like cricket more than soccer, I think, but they, they love their soccer team down there, and the you know, United States was coming, it was, you know, it was a big deal. Yeah. And uh, you know what's weird about seeing this game in Trinidad? They only, I called them, I, American Express, I had a platinum card then, but they have a concierge service that'll get you tickets. Sure. You know, so I called up the, to get a ticket to this U.S. men's team playing Trinidad in Trinidad. Uh, and the, the guy was like, let me check, Mr. Carey. And he's checking, checking, calls me back. He says, Mr. Carey, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but the, you can't buy a ticket uh, for this game unless you get it from the local KFC. Wow. <laughs> Colonel's got a piece of a fucking soccer action yeah. in Trinidad. And uh, down in Trinidad, KFC is so big. Like, there's no McDonald's. There's no Burger King. Don't fuck with the Colonel. There's no churches. What? No. KFC. And that's yeah. fucking it, man. In Jamaica, when I went to Jamaica, we were in uh, Montego Bay, and we were going from the airport to the to the house. The, it was a two-story KFC. Yeah. And they have things on the menu that they would never have here. It was gigantic. I was I was amazed. Yeah, my brother my brother was with me, and we went to like you've been to KFC, right? You've seen like most 
four people in front of you. Sure. Three people this is and you're like, oh God, biggest biggest where, lines. hey, for my fucking biggest things, three ever. people. <laughs> biggest yeah. lines. Yeah, and we went on Wednesday to get lunch at this KFC downtown of Trinidad, <laughs> and there was two lines out the door. What? Yeah. Out the we door? We were standing on the sidewalk. <laughs> you can't get some chicken. Waiting to get in there to get our chicken at KFC. It's fucking huge there. You can't have eat. So they- Did it taste any different? No, same thing. Yeah, same shit. Same, same chicken. And uh, no different, but they just love their KFC, man. I don't know what it is. It's crazy, right? Uh, Jamaican, actually, I have to say, the KFC, the chicken Did they made w was actually um, pretty amazing. Jamaican spices? Or Jamaican yeah, spices. Yeah, it was like jerk but they, chicken? They, they, because they, they you were make, fucked up. No, I wasn't fucked up. <laughs> Come on. Taking out the seeds it's and the twigs little. of the pot. No. Um, no, but I thought the chicken tasted different because the way, they, the way oh, okay. they cooked it and the way in To me, it tasted to just here. the same. But I, and I was like, I, this is like the craziest thing. And then in the soca music, they'll, 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 they'll like give a shout out to KFC. I, I can almost you know, wrap songs. my brain around that. But why do you have to go to the chicken place right. to get your tickets for soccer? They sponsored the game. So you had to go to the KFC to buy, get a ticket. So I went to KFC and I was like, yeah, I want to get two tickets to the game and a three piece. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The lady like and pulled out a, a bank account. The lady like pulled out a chart. Oh my god! And like, where would you like your ticket? So I told her, and she was able to like. There's go to grease the stains on this chart. She was able to like punch <laughs> into the computer and gave, she sold me my tickets. But you had to go to KFC, and that's the only way you can get a ticket. That's fantastic. But I happened to be staying at the same hotel that the men's team was, and they found out I was looking for a ticket, so they hooked up with me, oh. and uh, well, then I got to get, they gave me I got to be friends with them because they were staying at the stadium. I got to be friends with the front office uh, staff, the men's team. They started inviting me to sidelines when they played games. Then I got to, then I was able to pick their brains about the game. Then I became like a huge fan, and now it's like my favorite sport. And you had a thing for a while where you were a photographer and you traveled with a team. Right. You I did the, a thing for Discovery? Well, or? I was going on the sidelines. Right. I thought, oh, I'll bring my camera. And I started meeting photographers, and I found out like what equipment they were using. So I started just like bringing, I always wanted to do sports photography. So I started like, I, I remember I'm with the Sammy's camera here in LA, and I go, if I was gonna shoot sport, what would you buy? Wow. He goes, get this, this, and this. I just bought everything because I have money. I just bought everything. And then I <laughs> showed up and I had all these photographers right. that I befriended on the sideline. They showed me how to use my new camera equipment. And uh, I was actually uh, taking it seriously and trying to take better and better pictures. And one guy like, kind of took me under his wing and uh, he actually hired me to shoot the World Cup in Germany because I, I was getting pretty good by then. Uh -huh. Like not the greatest you've ever seen or anything like that, but I, I could shoot at a professional level. He stopped calling you TV boy? And actually yeah, referred, yeah. Referred to you as a cameraman? Yeah, and I actually, I used a fake name and I went to Germany and then the Travel Channel did a... Uh, travel Channel. Sorry. Yeah, Travel Channel, I did a special with them of me shooting the World Cup because I said, you know, I'm gonna be, it was called Drew Carey's Sporting Adventures and we did like the Real Madrid Barcelona game and... Uh, did you figure out an angle to make money off this? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do. It was a lot of work, man. But I, I, I but you loved like, it. Like shooting the game. Like if you're gonna shoot the World Cup, that's a lot of work anyway. Are you running constantly up and down the same way the players are to catch the action? No, not in Stationary. soccer. Soccer, you got to pick your spot and you're there the whole game. And at the half, you can switch. But you're the like a sniper. But at the World Cup, you're shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, and everybody's like a little folding chair that are like right now. You have to like climb over the chair. There's not even space between the chairs, and. Um, I had to get there sometimes like four hours for the game just to get a spot. And uh, for a guy who strolls in, the price is right at a half hour, four hours. That's no, I was working, man. Pain in the ass. And nobody knew the hell I was in Germany. You know, really? Nobody. Even the other photographers were like, kind of like, who's this dickhead celebrity? You know, right. doing our job because spots are hard to get. Right. Shooting the World Cup, and they didn't realize that I was there at the behest of this other guy who's trying to make money. That he actually hired me to shoot for him because he liked the way I shot. Right. And uh, so, but then Travel Channel is following you around with a camera. Yeah, they couldn't. While go, you're shooting, they couldn't go into the stadium. Like oh. they could, they could follow me till I went in to do my job. And when I got back, I would show them the pictures I took, and then we'd do other stuff in Germany when I wasn't shooting the game. So I was like, like shooting the games is hard enough, but then I had to do all this other stuff because you, you have so much equipment when you're shooting sports. Like I had like two packs full of uh, camera equipment that weighed like 70, 75 pounds each that I'm lugging around. It stopped being fun. It was fun, but it was just it was just like a job. Right, <laughs> you weren't used to that. No, I mean I'm used to doing stand up. Stand up was even easier because you, you have 23 hours to get ready for work when you're doing stand up. <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about an easy job. I would sleep till whatever, hit the mall. Yeah. You know, have a light dinner. <laughs> couple, you know, do the show, go out after a drink. I just came back from you know, Baltimore. I went to the Apple Store three times. Really great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Read a lot of books, saw a lot of DVDs. Okay. You know. Oh. It was a pretty nice life. 
But, uh, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't 70 pounds of gear. No, then you're like, eight, like work, 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 and then you're like, oh my God. Like, but I wasn't you loved there. it. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. But I wasn't there shitting around because this guy was counting on me. If I didn't get good pictures, he wasn't going to make a living. And what happened with these pictures? Uh, he I mean, used them still up on the site. And he sells them still. Did they, end, they end up on, in magazines? A couple of them, yeah. Soccer magazines and soccer sites. And so the first time you saw one of your photos in the soccer magazine? It was pretty cool. Yeah. 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 Wasn't I mean, I got, you know, I took a couple good, decent shots. Nothing great, like I said, but a professional level. But you don't get into that soccer magazine because it's Drew, Drew, Drew Carey taking no, I used a, a fake, photo. I used a fake name. Jim Carey? No, yeah. <laughs> Mariah. <laughs> that was my fake soccer name. Uh, righty. Hey, we like to involve the audience whenever possible, sir. Don't you dare. Uh, so uh, I want to bring in um, Barry Gribble. One of the uh, forms of questions here um, is a rapid fire of five questions that are specifically designed for you. It's kind of a Coke or Pepsi, no correct answer, but it's sure. which would you rather, Sophie's Choice kind of sure. thing. They are called a T5. T5. You know this crazy T5. son of a bitch? T5 forever now. That's what happened when we asked him to do the T5. We <laughs> rattled that off and we said, you know what? We'll turn that into a graphic. All right. From Barry Gribble, this T5 directly to you, sir. Improv or script? Uh, improv. Kale or spinach? Kale. Ron Paul or Bill Maher? Uh, neither one was going to get elected. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for Ron Paul to completely morph into Ross Perot. He's going to use the wrong analogy. <laughs> The economy is like peanut butter, see? <laughs> yeah. If you feed it to a horse and he chews on it, it'll look like he's talking. Uh, honest praise or thoughtful critique? Uh, thoughtful critique. Cirque du Soleil or soccer? Well, please. Well, I uh, mean, yeah, soccer. I love <laughs> soccer. Sorry. Yeah. That's those two things I like. Don't give me two things I like and make me pick one. Well, that's, the, that's yeah. kind of the deal. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are easy choices. Some of them, yeah. Yeah, like I, I love doing improv. Uh, Actually, you know, scripted is fun. You can lie about improv. So, like when it's happening and it's good, man, there's nothing like it. Well, did that start for you when you were doing the, um, the Drew, Drew Carey show? Drew show, yeah. And then. Because Ryan Stiles would come back, you know, during rehearsal. Like, people would talk, like, what'd you do last night? You know, I did a show in Santa Monica or blah, blah, blah. And uh, flew out to England and did uh, Who's Line. And. Uh, he did. Yeah, and I, I was. They were talking about it so much, and people would go see him and think, oh my God, you should, you should go sometime, he's so funny. And uh, I, you know, was doing the Drew Carey show, so I didn't, my act was my act, and I wasn't like writing any new stuff for my acts. Anything I wrote that was funny. Ended up in the was, show. Was going on in the show, yeah. And uh, so actually it was like, my act was getting kind of stale for me, and I was like, you know, if I did it, it was the same thing, you know, so, you know, you don't want to always do that. And, uh, I always want to learn how to do improv, and there's Ryan right Gen there. I'm working with him. Genius. You know, and then I found out that a couple other cast members, uh, like, I think, like, two, two other people on the cast used to teach it. Wow. And then, uh, you know, uh, Craig Ferguson used to do a little bit of improv, and I never did, and, and uh, Chris Miller never did. But I was like, hey, uh, why don't we do improv together on Thursday night? At the improv, I remember, I remember I went to the improv and I asked him, like, would you think it would be, oh, be okay if I brought the cast of the Drew Carey show here to do? I, th I thought that actually they would say no, that we're busy or something. <laughs> and they go, yeah, it'd be fine. So every Thursday night at the improv, like, we would go and do improv. All right, I remember this. And it was like the craziest. It was really fun. We did it for a couple of years. And um, um, like for a year at least with the cast, it, it was really, and I, I learned, they picked out games for me to do that I could do easily and that wouldn't hurt me for like me and Chris Miller to do that we wouldn't get murdered. And uh, I learned like OJT from these guys. And then when we were doing it, I thought, oh, you know, uh, I come out here about Who's Line, and I thought that ABC could have us. I thought they should do summer shows because they right. weren't doing any summer shows, and that could be a good thing for them to do. Yeah. So I told Ryan, I go, hey, why don't we do Who's Line as it anyway as a summer show pitched to ABC? And he goes, well, Dan Patterson's now he's the guy that created it on BBC Radio, and then the the show in uh, England. And he goes, Dan's out here trying to pitch it as a syndicated show. And he's just not, happened to be? Just happened to be in town and he's not having any luck. Oh my God. Like people, they didn't want to use like, I, I don't want to say he was pitching it to, but they didn't want to use Ryan or Colin because Ryan was goofy looking and Colin was old. <laughs> of course. You know what I mean? Of course. Like they were like, you should get Dan Cortez to do the, like that was there. <laughs> I <laughs> feel you. We should get all these young hip people to do uh -huh. the show. But they didn't, they, they were missing the point and Dan was getting really frustrated. And uh, 
So uh, I met with him, like, that was one Thursday. And then the next Thursday, Dan came over and we met. We were talking about what we, what we could do and maybe I could be the host. Right. And then I, you know, a couple Thursdays after that, the ABC executives came and saw us do improv. We gave them DVDs of Who's Line and, uh, or maybe tapes. And then, yeah, uh, probably. <laughs> probably tapes. And then, um, Max. a couple weeks after that, they said, yeah, you got a show. It was really like pretty quick. Yeah, it's remarkable. How and quick. it was so cheap to produce for them. You know, right. I think our original licensing fee was like 270000 an episode. Which is a ridiculously low number. Yeah, like shows nowadays get like, even the Drew Carey show was like. By the end, it was $3 million an episode. No. According to all reports. Was it? Yes. For whose line? No, for Drew Carey show. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like they spent a lot of money on licensing. Right. But for, for $270,000, like that was the lowest. Like there were shows on UPN that, weren't, that were getting more than that. Yeah. You know, we were like literally like the lowest licensed show on TV. But you know what's interesting when you get that low amount, you have, there's so much more freedom that comes you with it. You do anything it. you want. Louis C.K. show on FX right now, arguably the funniest half hour for a lot of us. Yeah. He, the only way he was able to write it, direct it, edit it, and star in it is if he agreed to do it for a fee not too similar, dissimilar to right. 270. And I like, and I lo I'm telling you, it's so freeing. Like I'd rather, now that I have, I'm saying that now that I have money. Sure. But I'd rather do like, I love doing like a small club and like just whatever I want than having the pressure of like, we gotta get ratings, we gotta get this and that. I'd, I'd, I'd rather just say, hey, let me do a 99 seater and do some well, improv and that might have, I imagine, I thought from studying up a little bit, factored into not just buying into a soccer team, but also you're walking into a legacy that's going nowhere that is not really about ratings. Yeah. It is a hit television show that no one can fuck up, really. No. I mean, they might have had to go through three or four different hosts if they were having trouble, you know, if you hadn't have worked out. But the show itself was going on. Yeah, the show's good. Yeah. It's a good show. It's rock solid, and its yeah. fans are as devoted as fans can be. Yeah, it'd be... Like, the whole idea is don't fuck it up. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it, there must have been some transitional pressures you put on yourself. And then m maybe once you felt comfortable, you started to make some changes with the theme and this and the that to make it your own. Yeah. I, I would think. That's about it. Yeah. Yeah, but I never felt any, like, I felt comfortable from day one. Did they say, mm -hmm. look, there's no pressure here in terms of ratings? We're, we're, you can't, you can't um, hurt us? Did they say I would, you, I'd hear this a lot. It's a marathon, not a sprint. I kept hearing that all the time. That I believed him. I know I shouldn't have, but I believed him. <laughs> well, but I, that was one of the first pieces of advice I got when I got to town, actually, as a stand-up in 1983. Someone saying, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Because I was, like, in a hurry to get something going. Yeah. So that's a pretty good piece of advice, Yeah, I would think. The advice you gave me, besides do the, the Tonight Show thing, was uh, if somebody takes you out to lunch, enjoy the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like that one? <laughs> yeah. Because it's probably... Solid advice, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too excited, man. Just to, hey, enjoy Just the meal. Just enjoy the meal. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I'll make you all kinds of promises. Yeah. I want to be in the Kevin Pollack business. Oh, boy, that's my favorite. We should do this and that. And you like, want to be in the... If you're new, you can get really sucked up into that and you forget about how great the chicken is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> concentrate on the chicken. And then... Uh, uh, the other thing is like the most important word in L.A. is uh, no. No. Uh, by far. That's the biggest word you can learn in, and fact, in life. In fact, Les Moonves gets a little more pissed off than just about anybody else at the word no with my personal experience. So I don't know how he felt when you were saying no. The, I didn't say no. I, I get, like, sometimes you don't hear it. But I, there was a, somebody gave me a really good phrase, and I have it taped so I can see it at my desk when I'm, at my, when I'm sitting at my desk. And it's uh, when you say yes... You say no to everything else. Oh wow! Once you, you commit yourself to something, that's everything else you could do that day, that hour is gone. Hmm. Nothing. You can't, you can't do anything. You have to do that one thing. Right. Uh, when you say no, you're saying yes to an infinite number of possibilities. You say no, eh, you can do anything. Yeah. Anything you want. Yeah. In the whole wide world. But in show business, the number one reason to say no is to own more of the soccer team. Yeah, but or you just like. No, I'd rather be, yeah, then you're committed to doing something if you say yes, and then you could be, honestly, you'd rather be reading a book or, you know, rather be with your kid. You'd rather be on a boat. You'd rather be in another city. Yeah. You'd rather be home, but you're on the road because you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Then you're like, well, oh, I, you know, I'm in this club. I'd rather, I'd rather be home with my wife and, you know. I remember when you said, would you? I'm a fire, but I'm, yeah. I said yes to this. I don't really need the money. Right. 
why did I say yes to this? I could be, I could have just said no and yeah. went home and been happier. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah. I remember feeling that way when I said yes to doing the voice of Mr. Bell. What? <laughs> <laughs> It was, was a good gimmick while it lasted. <laughs> that was fantastic. I remember the call when you said, as I, I mentioned this to Craig Ferguson, he was here, how he owed his entire career to both of us. Um, because I, I didn't want to be sixth lead. But, but I loved how you couched it when you called me. You said, look, Kevin. Kevin was the first boss on the Drew Carey Show. I don't imagine you want to be sixth lead on the Drew Carey Show, but the network really wants me to have a boss that the audience can see now. They like the gag so much, they actually want to have some, some interplay. So assuming you don't want to be the sixth lead on the show, we need to uh, fire you and have you d appear on the show, which was a great thrill after doing the voice of him for the first season, to actually walk out with my cardboard box full of Mr. Bell items. Yeah, we had a, it was a, just the voice of the boss. Yeah. I thought it was a good gag. I was on the speakerphone. It was fun. It was really fun. And, yeah. you know, it was an easy sell for you. You said, Kevin, you can phone this in from anywhere in the world because it's on the phone. Yeah. But the greatest thrill of all was walking out in front of your audience, finally, after that first, you know, at the end, was that in the first season? I think so. Right? I think yeah. so, too. Yeah, I mean, they made a lot of changes at the end of the first season. <sighs> and then, <laughs> yeah. But the second season is when the thing really kind of caught its... Yeah, that's because of the dance number and everything. They, well, they, we almost got canceled, you know, and they were, there was people at ABC that fought for us, and then they, honestly, they, during the summer, they double pumped us with uh, Roseanne and Grace Under Fire. Oh, boy. Like, they would, after in the reruns, they would put, it would be Roseanne, then me, and then Grace Under Fire, then me. So they double pumped us all, like the whole month, six weeks leading up to the premiere. And then the premiere we had, we couldn't ask for a better, and then the premiere we had the dance number that caused a big sensation, and right. we kind of took off from there. So, uh, um, Imagine a network actually getting behind and giving a but str they, at struggling first we, show a chance. We, we barely got a script, we got a script order, barely got a pilot order. I remember we got a, we were supposed to hear from them like Friday night at six o'clock uh, as per our contract for them to order a script so we could do a pilot or after we turned in the script for us to do a pilot and it got to be like 6.30 and I was like, oh, well, fuck <laughs> it. You know what I mean? Let's go see what Saget's doing. <laughs> yeah, oh well, gave it a shot. Wrote, the, wrote a pilot anyway, you wow. know, and then uh, got the call. <laughs> sure. You know, a half hour, 40 minutes later than the deadline. I was like, oh, whew. <laughs> And we did the pilot, and then I, you know, was really, I think the pilot barely got picked up, and then we did the first season, and then I heard pe a lot of people didn't want to bring us back, and then we got barely got picked up, and then they, they did, the thing that really saved us was getting double pumped with uh, uh, Rosanna Grace Under Fire, in my opinion. It wasn't well, the dance number, per se, but it was that interest they built up by repeating us with those shows. Well, it's all marketing. Yeah, so it's all marketing. you have to deliver once they bring you the audience. If right. your show's not funny, entertaining, all that marketing goes down. Yeah, but it's a lot of, it's so much marketing. You have to get that support, though. Yeah. And it's so hard to get now. It's almost impossible for these shows to last more than a couple of weeks. If, if the numbers don't deliver, there's no support, or yeah. so it seems. You hear that, John from Mars, or whatever the fuck that movie's supposed to be? <laughs> 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 What's it called? What's it called? Yeah. It's, it's supposed to be something from Mars, and they dropped the from Mars part. John Carter. John Carter from Mars. Yeah, it's supposed to be John Carter from fucking Mars. Yeah. That's that's the book. That's what's supposed to... Well, the book is called Princes of Mars, and all the other subsequent books are of Mars. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a show on fucking Mars. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I thought it was... When I saw the first ad for it on the billboard, I thought it was a guy in Africa. John Carter? I thought it was John Carter, and I thought, oh, he's in Africa or something fighting an elephant. I, I couldn't see what the monster, that they were monsters real clearly on the billboard. Right. If you just hear John Carter, I thought it was like a Spike Lee movie. Yeah. Like it does it sound It like felt like Carter. Denzel for yeah, sure. Like exactly. John Carter exactly. like on Mars. Yes. Now we know what we're talking about. Now I know what you're talking about. Yeah. No, that's all marketing. Uh, and the film did not open as well as they wanted no, but it to? It, I think the marketing did kill that movie. I saw it. I went to the premiere and I actually had a really good time. It was very enjoyable. I wonder how it did on Mars. <laughs> Probably better than here. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the Lorax. Well, Rocks beat it in its second week. Thirty. Okay. Uh, John Carter made I think twenty nine million, thirty million. But it's doing really well overseas, and I think who knows that because book? You know why? Because it's called John Carter from Mars overseas. Maybe overseas. <laughs> they got it right. Um, I want to talk about the drive that you Florida and uh, Helford would take to break stories for the new season. Yeah. At the when end did our, that start? Uh, at the end of the first season, uh, he didn't fly, and I well before we did the show uh, even uh, he didn't fly, and uh, afraid of flying. And uh, we wanted to go to, he wanted to go to Cleveland and do some research in the city. 
and see what the city was all about. And so it was like January. And I remember we wanted to get a rental car and have Warner Brothers pay for it, or ABC pay for it, or Warner Brothers. They were giving us a hard time about paying for it. And he's like, you think I want to drive in January to Cleveland for, because for vacation? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Give us some money for hotel rooms. <laughs> so we drove from uh, LA to Cleveland in the winter and like hung out and he saw my house and um, went to a couple of local bars and got the inspiration for the Warsaw and uh, drove back. And then it was such a successful trip that at the end of every season we would get in the car and just drive somewhere, usually Florida or someplace like that. But and, across the country. Yeah, and we would talk about the show and you know listen to music and you know then drive back. It was always really fun. Right. And I loved it. Was I, it. I really look forward to those drives. Was it every year? Yeah, every single year. And so you would often break stories for the next season? Or well, we think about like, not stories, not specific stories, but like how the season would go. Right. You know, things that we could have done better that we didn't and how it could be better next year and, you know, stuff we want to do, you know. Uh, got the idea from the dance number on one of the drives. Really? Yeah. That was so huge. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, because I was on um, a show called The Good Life with John Campanera. I played oh, yeah. his best friend. And as a joke one day, we were talking about, like, coming in and doing a big uh, Busby Berkeley number, you know, and Splash the camera overhead, yeah. yeah. And uh, we were laughing like that, that'd be hilarious. And I remember the producer was like, yeah, next year. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> we were only like half serious. He didn't get it next year, but you did. He was only really half joking about it anyway. Right. You know what I mean? And I was telling Bruce about that, and he goes, hey, you know, a dance number could be a good thing. And uh, How Did the network fight you at all? Because it was pretty bizarre. No, no. I, I don't think they did. Someone Bruce did all the talking to the network, not right. me. So I mean, they might have, but I didn't hear about it. I think they were behind it all the way. And how ridiculously fun was that? Yeah, it was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, it all worked out. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go to Eddie Nunn. Another T five for you, T5. sir. T five. T five. Hugh Keckner. This one's going to be a little harder. Seen from a hat or hoedown? Uh, either one to me, they're both good. Yeah. yeah. Ferguson or Letterman? Not really fair to ask Ferguson's that. Ferguson's my friend. Yeah, exactly. Bald, <laughs> bald like both. jokes, tall jokes, or fat jokes? None really apply. Uh, to, about me? I, it just or, says bald jokes, tall jokes, or fat jokes. Oh, because probably on the who's line, we'd make bald jokes about Colin, tall jokes about Ryan, and fat jokes about me. Uh-huh. I'd say bald and fat, uh, bald and uh, tall jokes. Tall, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, you can't really do the fat jokes anymore. Now can they? Roasted or be roasted? Oh, to be roasted. The, Honestly, that's the that was the most fun. The worst, the meaner they were to me, the better. I, like uh, Kivadada had the best <sighs> line ever. He said, uh, "Boy, that Drew Carey, he has a temper." Well, let me tell you, Kivadada goes, "Man, that Drew Carey has a temper." Let me tell you. I remember one time I was uh, fucking him up the ass. I wiped my dick on his dress. <laughs> well, his head popped out of that toilet. <laughs> he must have chased me around the gas station for an hour. <laughs> he wrote the best fucking jokes ever. He was the greatest. Dada was a motherfucker. I was like, and it just got felt like, uh, first of all, he has a temper. <laughs> yes, right. Good, good setup. And then I was fucking him up the ass and I wiped my dick on his dress. <laughs> We're that, done. That could be the end. Most people are done. Most people are done. Head in the, the toilet. But then his head, Gas popped, station. his head popped out of that toilet. And you got a good image right there of me like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, water, just what the fuck? Paid out how much money I paid for this truck? And he must have chased me around the gas station for now. I mean, it got better and better and better. Yeah, he built it. Oh, my God. He yeah, built it funny. on a foundation of filth. Yeah, that was funny. Uh, and the last one is uh, The Sims of the Second Life. Oh, Sims or second, second life. life? Second life. Second life. Yeah, second life. You can you know design all your own stuff, and it's a lot more, a lot more freedom in second life than Sims. Yeah, all the Sims is fun. It's, it's like second life clearly has a lot more to offer. There's a game I play uh, called Second Life that some people know about. Uh huh. And you can tell by looking in my eyes. I don't yeah. know what the fuck you're talking uh, about. And it's, I know what he's talking about. Are Jeez. you on Second Life? I, I don't do Second Life, but I know the game, but I, I did Sims, but I, I got too obsessed with Sims that I couldn't do Second Life. Second Life is so much cooler. What, what's you, the additional? Nothing. You just It's like having a train set, honestly. You, you have a, um, it'd be like if I said I was really into train sets and I had this beautiful train set in my basement and you would go, oh, you know. <laughs> it's like that. So <laughs> I might say I'd like to see that train set. Yeah, Second Life, uh, it's a, I hate, I hate to even call it a game. Uh, you 
sign up and it's you a get a life choice. If it's what is it's it? It's a second life, and All you right. make a avatar, and you can have any avatar you want. Make it look however you want. Name it whatever you want, and then it lives in this world. And you meet other avatars and socialize and chat. And there's there's some there's some combat, but not really if you don't want it to be. A little role playing going on. Yeah, if you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be a vampire, or a, you know, a furry or whatever you want to be, and people live <laughs> in those. spend real money, though. Yeah, you, uh, Linden is the name of the company that makes it, so they have Linden Dollars, and mm -hmm. you, you can um, earn Linden Dollars in-game, or you can just get your credit card out and buy Linden Dollars at the exchange, the Linden Exchange, which is, uh, uh, doesn't fluctuate much, it's pretty steady, and they keep a, they keep a lid on it. So you can buy... Linden Dollars that Linden Exchange and use that to buy your clothes and your house and your car and and a turn to dad soccer team and your you know your jewelry and wherever you want to you know hair make your appearance good a lot of people spend on just looking good but you can create an island and someone like I think it was a news report where they created an island or a big uh, building and they sold it for a lot of real money yeah so that you could buy to it other from players the person, real yeah. money yeah. to buy that island so you could have that island in the game. You're buying and selling real estate within a, a yeah. full world. For real money. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, that, it's not as much money as people think. Like, you can't really make a living in Second Life, but people make money. Hundreds of dollars. Yeah. They make a little bit of money. Some people do if they work, you know. Like, I go to, there's, uh, I go to nightclubs and hear DJs, and there's people, like, you can go to a nightclub and they'll see some guy who's DJing and he lives in England, you know, and he's playing all Brit pop music, and, you know, he's in his house, but it's like songs I haven't heard. And, right. You know, other people will be have other nights and they'll play, you know, and you can make your avatar, avatar dance and stuff. It's Pretty cool. It's like, the best thing about it is I'm not Drew Carey <laughs> in there. I'm somebody else. Uh-huh. And I can just go there and just be me and just relax and talk to people. And I don't, it's not me, the celebrity, talking to people. Right. It's fun. Nobody knows who anybody is. Yeah. Right. And it's like, you know, once you get into, it's just like life or moving to a new town. When you first get there, you're like, well, I don't know. But once you meet the cool people that you want to be friends with, then it's really fun. But you, you have to die? like, huh? Did you die in, in the second line? No, no. I died, my first character, who was J.D. Salinger, that was my first character, he died in a fire from the oven. I created oh, that was in Sims. In The Sims, yeah. and I created another J.D. Salinger, and he kept his last J.D. Salinger in an urn. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what I did. You didn't bury him in the backyard with a cross? <laughs> no, and uh, I had a little urn oh, on the fireplace. Oh, you could bury him in the backyard, too, if you want to. In the <laughs> well. <Sims. laughs> well, you went the cremation route? I went the cremation route, yeah. yeah. He kept ashes yeah. of your dead character from the... Well, Salinger kept ashes of his, of his former self. <laughs> That's what happened to me. Uh, I like Second Life better because you can really like, it's super customizable compared to The Sims. And, uh, you know, it's just, you can just, like you can make everything you want or buy anything you want and just have a, like I have a really cool island. Huh? Yeah, a couple, I have a couple islands that are really fun and I just, you know. Of a movie theater, uh -huh. you know, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, it sounds pretty great. Yeah, you get to escape, and I like the idea that yeah, it's, it's a lot of escape. It's a little eyes wide shut for you, in the sense that you know you're in a mask and nobody knows who anybody is. Right. Yeah. yeah there's a couple people know who I am, but it's really, and I met the coolest people on there. Honestly, I've, have you spent any time in, away from the game with any of these people? Uh, I planned on it, but the one guy couldn't get away. He was in. Uh, uh, I was going to meet up with him. There was a Second Life convention. I was going to. Hook up with them and but once you show up at that, now everybody knows you're in the game. Yeah, and, I, and we were gonna make him. He lives down in like near Cincinnati, and I was gonna like hook up with him. But it would never, never happen. Mm. But we talked on the phone. Right. You know. And that's how you found out who you were. No, I told I told him before because he was I I got introduced to him from another friend of mine who knew who I was. Was playing the game. Yeah, yeah. It was Second Life when they first came out was like it made a big splash, and it's never in the news much anymore. It's kind of like there, uh, but. It, when it first came out, it was like, oh, this is going to be the next big thing, and this is, people are going to be able to shop on here, it's going to be the new metaverse, you know, like, you know, they talk about in science fiction books, like a William Gibson book come to life, but it, it never really turned out that way, but it's still a fun place to go to. Is that to what life. draws you guys to it initially, is your love of science fiction? And, and What's part of it, I was like, at first I was like, oh my God, you could do shopping here, and they can have a virtual Kmart, like they did have virtual... Uh, like they had a virtual American apparel and they had a virtual Mercedes dealer on Second Life for a while, but it was just like, you don't really get the same sense. It, it was just never, there's not enough people that can get on an island. That, like, you can have like 40 people on an island at the m most. You know what I mean? But they're, 
you know, without having a lag time and stuff. You get more than that, but it's, then it starts to get laggy and stuff. It's just, um, but it's fun, you know? Yeah. It's like you can get together with like 20 people and socialize. And there's like card games and dice games you can play with people. A lot of gaming going on, you know? I've sat with friends and played cards, you know, and just talked. And you can do voice now, so you can get on a thing and talk to people. Oh, that's got to be good. So you can have meetings there. And, yeah. Yeah. That, so it's, it's just a weird nerdy thing. That it's makes it a little more personal. Yeah, it's just a kind of a nerdy thing. Uh, but we, 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 your love of games has been uh, documented, sir. Yeah. It's not a complete mystery. Um, half a million dollars for the Ohio Library Foundation. That was on uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah. I just got lucky. Did you? Yeah. Total lucky. Total really? Lucky. Yeah. To get I, show, to the half I should have got the I should have got the million. I was afraid to go for it. I didn't know it. It was who's who's the my million dollar question was who's the first uh, NFL player to say I'm going to Disneyland. How could you possibly know that? Uh, I should have. Uh, I can't remember. It was Phil Sims, I think, was the first. You can look it up. But I think it was Phil Sims. Uh, I was, yeah. I wasn't totally sure, and I would have lost everything. Yeah. So I couldn't go. Also, you, could you look like a bigger dick losing half a million dollars because y your pride wants to try to answer that last yeah, question? Yeah, you don't want to do it. No way. Yeah. Uh, so you came back and won another amount, like 32 or something, and it made you the highest winning celebrity in the history Did I? Of, of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Really? Yep, the celebrity version. I've also given away, as a game show host, I've given away f $4 million on primetime TV. You're the only person... <laughs> To give away a million dollars on three different shows, really? that's never been done. Yes. Well, I give away a million on Power 10. I give away three million on Price is Right. On the nighttime, uh, the million dollar spectacular version of Price is Right on primetime. What was the third one? Yeah, what was the third one, you fuck? You can't bring this shit up without knowing. Well, I have four million, I, that's four million right there that I've given away. Um, I've got it. <laughs> maybe, it was on, maybe, maybe it was two different Price is Rights and uh, or three different prices rights in the power of 10. But it's three million on prices right. We had a million dollar spectacular shows that we did and I gave away, they changed the, I don't know why they, they made it so easy to, to win a million dollars. Did they? Yeah, like <laughs> the, sh I couldn't believe it. Like the, uh, power 10 was pretty amazing. It was our, the first taping we ever did, we gave away a million dollars to some 19 year old kid. And uh, could have won, could have gone for 10 million, but he didn't. And on prices right, I remember one person won because uh, he had to get the showcase within, on the, on the regular show, if you get the showcase within $250 and you win, and you're within $250 of the showcase price, you win both showcases. But then on the Million Dollar Spectacular, they made it so you have to get within $1,000 of the mm. showcase price and win, and then you win a million dollars. And that gets a little easier? Well, it's only $1,000, not $250. Yes. They should have made it 100 Right. You know, or 50 bucks or something for a million dollars. But they made it a thousand. Right. But they added extra prizes, thinking it would be harder to do the extra prizes. Right. Like instead of three prizes, they put in five or something. But all I had to do is add up two, two more prizes. I thought it was, I thought they made it easier. Uh, it, it seems that but way. But that wasn't my call. I also love. <laughs> yeah. Right. But I noticed we haven't had any million dollar spectaculars since then. What about this? Terry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We gave away three million dollars, and all of a sudden, like, hey, hey, hey do another million dollar spectacular. But this, uh, this Terry Nice fucks changed things up a little bit, too. Oh, that dude. That dude uh, who he bid... Got it he got the exact amount. To the penny... Right. ...on both showcases? Uh, yeah, he won both showcases because he got his showcase on the... Right to the dollar. Right. Yeah. And somebody on a headset's got to be freaking out. Well, we all thought something happened. Right. It's a long story. Uh, oh, I read, I read almost a, a documentary the, about it. The Inquirer... Not the Inquirer, but the uh, Esquire. It was Esquire, right? that wrote an article about it, yeah. that's pretty much the story. Somebody, I mean, all the press obviously jumped on the fact that, that you were The Esquire article kind of gives the whole story. Yeah, 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 look it up. It's a pretty great story, and, and there's no reason he didn't really. He didn't cheat. No, he didn't. It's like the guy with the fucking whammies. He figured out the repetitive nature of certain aspects. Well, we, like, we saw the tape of everybody, and we have cameras everywhere on the show, and there's sure. the, the, there was a guy, there was a fan group that was upset uh, that the, there was a producer on the show my first year that had been there 35 years. Right. There was, he'd been there his whole television career. It was his first job out of college. And uh, then he wasn't there my second year of the show. And this fan group that really liked this guy, and they were very upset that he wasn't there anymore. They might have blamed you? Yeah, they thought it was me or somebody. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden they, you know, and then I, I was like, 
after he left, and I started changing showcases and stuff, and then they then they then they didn't like me anymore. They didn't blame me for getting for him not being there, but then I started doing different stuff. And then they were mad at me for changing things and right. uh, thought the show was spinning out of control without this guy's steady hand, and so they, they were really upset. So all that was building up to this, right? right. And so one of the guys from this group, and they were like super fans, where they would like at the end of every show publish on their website like who bid what, what the amounts of all the prizes were. Like it was like a stat sheet for the show. Right. And uh, Box scores. they'd only change the prizes like every, they'd only introduce like every, like six new prizes a week on the prices, right? Which is a that lot thing. of repeats. A lot of repeats. And they hardly ever changed anything. Though you'd see the same boat, the same cooker, the same grill, the same cars, and uh, all the time. And uh, hardly any changes, and now it's like we did, like we changed so much you can't keep up, right? You know, so it would never happen again. But um, but it's amazing how it didn't change for thirty something years. Well, you know, they would get like, uh, you know, it was a, the it, was, it was it was a good show, it was doing well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, why you gotta fuck things up? <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, like it was yeah. fine. Yeah. The ratings were good. Like everybody was happy. Yeah. Um, so uh, Bob's always going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> He's never going to age or get tired of doing the show. Um, so uh, this, there was a guy from the, this fan group that was able to which showed up, and he was in the front row or the second row, the first second row of the, sh of the show. I can't remember now uh, during the taping, and uh, he was giving people advice, like people do from the audience. We encourage them to yell out what they think the price is. They're always yelling. Yeah, one guy won a Chevy one time on the show. He was with a friend of his that was a Chevy salesman. Oh, geez. And got every number just, and uh, so what? Yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes. And uh, so this guy was like, got somebody got a perfect one bid, got an extra 500 bucks, because this guy gave him the price. Right. Because he'd seen the one bid before. Then uh, some lady was paying one away and got every single number exactly and was like looking at this guy and changing the number because this guy was yelling out, no, that's five, seven. <laughs> you know, oh, I make that a seven. You know, because she'd look back and say, so she, she, she won a car. And then uh, I think somebody else maybe got a one bid exactly. I'm not sure, but for sure one person got a one bid exactly. And then I think it was the guy actually that won the thing. But when that guy that that ended up in the showcase, when he was doing his pricing game, it was in door two, and we were really far away from that guy. Oh, yeah. We couldn't hear him. Good. And he lost his pricing game. But then he won on the wheel. Then he got to the showcase. When he got to the showcase, you know, it's three things everybody's seen before. Certainly the guy from the... Fan. This, this uh, Rain Man dude from the, <laughs> from the fan group. <laughs> yeah. And he was able to give this guy an amount that happened to be the exact amount. To the fucking penny. Which I think was like, I think the guy was probably as surprised as anybody that he got it to the penny. But he's like, oh no, that's something, that's something he had and he gave him, the, gave him a price. It was the price to the dollar. And I remember Kathy Greco was producing the show and was not on the show anymore either. She retired, but she came out with her headphones. She was like, like that. And I was like, what happened? She goes, she had her clipboard. He got the exact amount. And I go, I went like, what? And what was the item? I feel, there was like, there's always like three, four things. I don't know. And I go, I go, did that ever happen before? And she goes, no. That had never happened before. No, so that's what she said right away. So then we had a big, we shut down for like 10 minutes, right. 15 minutes, which is a long time. Uh, and everybody was like, that standards and practice there. What are we going to do? What does this mean? What does this mean? Yeah, does this have, is this possible? Right. You know, could this even happen? And we knew that the... the Did the someone cheat? That's got to come. Yeah, and this fan group had a lot. Of, we knew that this guy was yelling out prices because we knew the people that were in the fan group. But then... Like, they were always getting a lot of inside information about the show, and we never knew how they were getting their information mm -hmm. about things we were planning or things we were doing. And they just had a lot of contacts, right. you know, with the, in the show. And they were mad about this guy not being here. So we all thought, like, oh, they're just fucking with us now because they're mad. And now they're oh, trying to they're hurt the show. Oh, they produced for the 35-year... Yeah, now they're mad because the guy's not here anymore. They're just trying to fuck with us now. And they got the prices, and then now, they're, now they're trying to screw with the show. Right. That's the first That's what's going on during the 10, 15 minute break. Yeah, everybody thinks like, so let's give the guy his prize right now and we'll investigate it. And so when we come back on the air and you're not thrilled for the guy, which is all, all well, of the I fucking think press I'm, talking I think about. I'm fucking, I think I'm fucked. Right, you're out of a job. I think I'm out of a job. You think they're shutting down the show? I think, I'm, I think they're shutting down the show. Yeah. I think, well, this is fucking it. I have a soccer team. Yeah. No, I thought like, this is, I'm fucked now. Yeah. You know, I, I had nothing to do with anything. So how shocking that you weren't happy. I was like, fuck this guy. <laughs> you think I'm giving him a, 
slap on the back or whatever. <laughs> hey, congratulations. Yeah. You got the exact number. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I was like, go fuck yourself. That's, how, that's If you're going to fuck the show over, go fuck yourself. Yeah. But I didn't know the whole story at the time. I should have. And then... Uh, well, I don't think anyone did. I go, is this going to... I remember asking, is this ever going to air? I, I don't know how we could. I remember hearing that from somebody. And I thought they were never going to air it anyway. Right. So I was like, well, fuck it. <laughs> they said that before you went back on the air. And, I didn't think they could. Right. Yeah, I remember hearing somebody wondering how they could even air it, right. you know, if there was a scandal. Right. You know, and I was like, well, this is fucked. You know, I mean, I was so depressed right then. Sure. And uh, then they, uh, turns out that nobody did anything wrong. Like, this guy, you can't, by listening to the audio, like, if, if somebody happens to have bought the exact GE microwave that were given away, and knows the price and yells it out, and the guy wins the microwave, fine. That's part of the game? Part of the show. Yeah. We encourage people to yell out, but you should have, like the meetings we had. But the like, number was like seven, six different numbers. It was crazy. It yeah. wasn't like 4,700. No. You know, it was ridiculous. Yeah, down it was to right the, on the, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. And so we, everybody thought that something happened. And somebody from, we thought somebody from the staff had, was also mad about this and was cooperating with the fan group and was like, just to fuck the show over, gave the guy the price of the showcase. Yeah, you and didn't have to be Oliver to Stone to see a conspiracy theory going down. Yeah, so I mean, there was such an investigation, you can't believe, and... Uh, turns out? Turns out the guy was just, was able to, because we never... He beat the game? He, yeah, because we didn't repeat, because we repeated prizes so much, he was able to just like memorize all the major ones we give away. Yeah, the story on NASCAR is this guy would like flashcards. He was a weatherman, and he was he had he had made a 30-something year career of his own memorizing stats for other w lines of work. It's not tough to do. Throughout his life. It wouldn't have been tough for anybody to do. To it's not a the, rain man. To beat the prices, right. right? Yeah, back then, but now. Back then. Good luck to you. <laughs> yeah. we, could, we could have the same car every single prize, and you would never get it. If, it, if it's a $19,000 car, one time, that we'll change the options and make it a twenty-one thousand dollar car, a twenty thousand dollar car, a twenty-five thousand dollar car. And now it's more of a game. You know. Now it's not our memorization skill. Yeah, it's more of a game. You really, yeah, it's more of a game. Well, it's kind of what the heart of the game was when it was launched, I'm sure, and over the years. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, you do get the uh, comfort with certain sponsors coming in, where you're like, right. okay, so you just use this thing because they're there all the time, and right. now it's like constant meetings, constant prize pitching. You know, like that's never going to happen again. And you, I, honestly, all those guys are, if you want to come wait in line, they never had to wait in line before, so not going to. But if you want to wait in line and, and come see the show and try your best, never going to be able to like, do that again. Right. Yeah. Down to the penny. Yeah, never. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. L literally crazy. Um, you, uh, again, the, the, the list is ridiculous. New York Times bestseller list for several months with uh, dirty jokes and beer stories of the unrefined. That was a celebrity book. Yeah, but you kind of went out of your way to fuck if with that a, system, too. If you have a TV show, it's easy to get a bestseller because if, if you're on the air. Especially back then. Yeah, but that's not a big deal. Uh, yeah, well, I found what was interesting about it was not that you were on the bestsellers list for several months, but that you kind of went, tried your best to fuck with the design of a celebrity book. Like you wanted to go off on this area, and they said, "Well, you gotta clean this up." And you said, "Well, if I give you that, you know." Uh, I really did kind of like uh, yeah. bargain for things. Yeah, you did. You know, because you could have just phoned it in. Yeah, but I have so much money at stake. I bought my house with that book. Hello. Yeah, like that's the weird thing. Like there was such a big advance and everything. And I was able to, um, you know, and I, I really kind of fucked it up. Honestly, I, I really needed like a two, three more passes to be honest, and I didn't have time because was, it was a deadline and I waited so long to start it. Right. That was kind of under the gun and I was like, oh shit, I gotta take this book out now. Well, now that it's time and for I you would to type, get... do a word count, type, do a word count. Really? Yeah, because I knew how many words it had to be and I was just like pressured to come up with this thing. And, uh, you know, I wrote it pretty quick. I should have been like, from the minute I got the deal, I should have been writing, 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 but right. I didn't. I waited and they would, I remember them saying, well, you know, in the TV business, in the movie business, when they say your script is due on April 1st, you, you give them a script on April 1st. Yeah. You know what I mean? You go, okay, here's your script. But in the book business, say it's in, you know, no, say it's in, you know, August, and they say your book is due, you know, April 1st. Uh, you know, August 30th, they're expecting the first chapter. 
they want to see the progress as you're going. Oh yeah. And then you know finally the end comes at you know I can't wait to see how that ends. Like they're like they're getting a serialized version of your book. Right. You know with revisions along the way from the first chapters and stuff, but they want to see your progress as you go. And I didn't realize that. I was like, all right, well, do April first, see April first then. Well, and I remember getting a call like, hey, where, where the hell are the chapters? Book, how's the book going? <laughs> yeah. That's kind of right. I got some ideas in my head. <laughs> Noodle it around. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I was in New York, and I remember they sent one of the one of their editors to meet with me, and he was like, "No, you got to, you know, you got to throw up some chapters." Give us something. So I had to like think of all this at the, you know, I was I knew I had a book due, but I was doing the show, and I mean, I was kind of busy, right? And I, could, and I had to kind of rush this book out, and it became a bestseller, but it could have been a lot better. All right, well, I'm not saying I'm not proud of it. You're it's, giving me valuable advice. You're you're returning the advice favor. Because I have my first book finally coming out. This is how long it takes when you're not a television star <laughs> to get your first book out. It's called How I Slept My Way to the Middle. <laughs> See, it's a funny title at least. Um, and so the advice is actually bust some ass, bust a lot more ass than, you know. Because I'm taking it pretty seriously. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the way to do it. But I was, and I did, but I was like, man, I really had to like uh, shut down my life for a and just like not talk to anybody or answer a phone or anything like 12 hours a day and just bump, pump this thing out. And by the time I got it done, I was like, hmm, would have loved to have been able to, like I read some of it now and I'll go like, man, if I had a couple more passes at that, I could have made it a lot better. Right. You know, it's tough when you're doing your first one. You'd like to do another, like if I wrote another one, I would really take my time and not. Well, that was my follow-up it. question because that book was a while ago. Why not another one? It takes a lot of, t- a lot of work. Too much work. A lot of time, man. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you don't want to put out any kind of like bullshit. Like no. A, you know. So. But you carried around a seventy-pound bag full of cameras. Yeah, I was taking pretty good pictures. It was a fake name. Like I, like I would like to do, like do something like that again. It's just time. Yeah, I don't mean a, another book along the same lines. I mean another book for, that involves your other interests, like the soccer thing, for example. Um, the reason I keep coming back to it is, you're, you know, you were saying how you wish more people would would follow the game. Speaking for that mass of ignorant Americans. Um, like, Jamie was raised uh, in Pittsburgh, so hockey is the world, right? Right. So f- being from California, sp- specifically Northern California, long, grew up long before the Sharks, I didn't know anything about hockey because no one played it. There were no sure. ice rinks. There was no reason for me to, Who knows from hockey? to be taught the game. Right. So I was educated by her, and the first time I actually went to a live game, having heard for years You've not seen a sport played until you watch live hockey. It is the most... It's really fun. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, the pace, the chaos. There are no plays here. <laughs> no, they're just chasing that little fucking puck. And they're kicking... So it, it is engrossing. From, so from the mass ignorant America, the soccer field is expansive. There's a couple of guys chasing around the ball. They're kicking it around. And that thing is taking forever to get from side to side. This country is driven on scoring points. How frustrating is when you, you understand seven, I'll give the you seven, art form? I'll give you seven points per goal then, if you want to see some score. Like, that's what I tell people. Right. Like, fuck it. If it scores, like, the Galaxy lost 3 1, their home opener, make it 21 to 7. You happy? <laughs> <laughs> there. Oh, look at all the scores they got. 20, they, they, they did they, four times, three times one guy's team scored, one time the other team scored. Sometimes it's 2 to 1. So if you saw a 14 7 game, you wouldn't think you got ripped off or something right. like that. But that's all they did was, or if it was 20 to seven, it was two scores and two field goals. Two times they got sh- close and they didn't quite make it, so they let them kick a field goal. Yeah. And you it know? is the nuance of players in other sports. Big deal. You know, it wasn't that Michael Jordan could score all those points, it was how he did it. You know, there, there is yeah. finesse and nuance to great sports. Yeah, in soccer, we only give you one point for completing the goal right. of scoring. Right. Soccer, they give you, or in, football, in the NFL, they give you seven. Right. You know, they only give you six plus the extra kick, but it's seven. Right. You know, and there's no, you don't get credit for getting close like you do in, the, in, in American football. So you're allowed to, oh, we got close. Let them get three points anyway if they can kick it. Like, there's none of that in soccer. You either do it or you don't. Right. You know what I mean? If it hits the crossbar or if you, you know, if you shoot it wide, tough shit. You don't get credit for that. Right. You don't get credit for coming close. And you either do it or you don't. And we only give you one, you know, we'll keep, that's one time you did it. We don't right. give you extra points for doing your thing. It's a lot. It's pure. The earn ratio yeah. seems extremely it's more It's really hard to score a goal in professional 
men's soccer right. on a professional level. It's a tough thing to do. And anytime it happens, it's, it's like really amazing. Yeah. You know, just to get one goal, you're like, what the fuck? Like, you, gotta, you can't believe the work that goes into that. Did you see the footage recently of Woody Harrelson scoring? He, Woody Harrelson played, he got into a game, was, there was 70 or 80,000 people at this stadium. I wish I could remember, it was not a celebrity game. I wish I could remember what the team was that he, he somehow got on the roster. Wow. Yeah. We have to look this the up actor? online. The actor Woody Harrelson. Look it up real quick. And in the other room, too, with the, uh, with the faster uh, bandwidth. Um, yeah. And scored, and I saw footage of it. And it was the same thing where it was, um, what's the uh, sudden death kick at, towards the Oh, end? penalty kicks? Yeah. Penalty. They only do that when a, when a team has to advance. They normally don't do that. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, in a normal game, it's, if it's tied at the end, it's tied. Right. Because you get the standings, you get three points for a win, one point for a tie, no points for a loss. So the rule of thumb is you want to get three points at home, one point on the road. If you're on the road, you get a tie, that's good. Right. And we recognize that sometimes, you know, your two teams are about the same and nobody's going to, you know, there's no winner. Right. And it's okay. You know, it doesn't right. have to be, I'm better than you. It it's have about to the accumulation of points. Right. Over a course of the season. Throughout the season. Yeah. And then also, like in the Premier League, uh, I love how they do it in the English Premier League. There's 20 teams, right, in the league. And uh, if you have the most points at the end of the season, guess what? You're the champion. Wow. No playoffs. Right. They don't need playoffs. Nope. If you get the most points, you're the winner. Uh, and what they do to make the end of the season interesting, though, because like a, lo a lot of times, you know, Spanish League or the Premier League, you know, the team runs away with it. And you're like, well, you know, a month before the season ends, you know they're going to win. Right. No way they're going to win. Uh, so what they do is uh, the bottom three teams in the league, 18, 19, and 20, if you finish in the bottom three, you get demoted to the league below that. You get Holy sent, shit. Your, your whole fucking team gets sent to the minors. And then the top three teams from the lower league get promoted up. Oh, wow. And they, that cascades down all the way down to the pub team level in right. England. So, like, in theory, you and your friends could start in a pub league and get promoted up every year. And 20 years later, you have, you're in the Premier League Jeez. playing for the championship. That's Pretty fucking wicked right there. It's crazy, yeah. yeah. And that's like, I mean, Clint Dempsey is a really famous player uh, from America that plays in England now. He's doing really well. When he first went to England, uh, his team was in danger of getting relegated. They call it relegation. And uh, he scored a goal in their last game and saved them. So they finished uh, 17th. 17th. Yeah. Oh, wow. And they called him like, the, they were calling him like the $20 million man or the $40 million man because that's how much money it would have cost them. To get them out down. Because you lose all your TV money. Right. All that shared revenue was out the fucking door. Now there's the impact of a single goal. Yeah, and that like you, if you watch these games on satellite TV, you know, when you're watching, like if a team gets relegated, this is the last game of the season. Like people are crying, like grown men, like tears. It's devastating. Devastating. Yeah. Like, you, like I'm never coming back. Like if you. Tom Brady didn't look that busted up. Yeah. <laughs> I'll lose in the Super Bowl. Yeah, but I'm like, well, yeah, that's, he comes in second. Right. But if they, let's say you're the, name a shitty kid, like Detroit Lions when they were b bad in the NFL. And they had a, you know, a bad year, the first bad year with Matt Millen, you know, or whatever. And uh, they don't do so good. And all of a sudden, you're a they're, minor they're team. playing in the Canadian League. Right. Sorry, you're playing in the Canadian League now. <laughs> yeah. So everybody in Detroit's like, hey, yeah, uh. NFL's coming up and... Oh, we're in the Canadian League. We gotta <laughs> learn all these other teams and fuck. Yeah. You know, now we can't afford these guys. And now what do you do? Do you take out loans to buy players to get back in the NFL? Or like, say you're the, like name a bay, bad baseball team, Kansas City maybe. Or, there you go. Or, so Kansas City, bad baseball. So your team finishes the bottom of the American League. And all of a sudden you're in AAA. You're AAA ball. Like how do you get fans to come see? That's devastating. I, I, th those like, are you, terms how, I've not heard How are you before? gonna sign players? Yeah. How are you going to say, then you get a promise, like, don't worry, we'll get back next year, we'll be in the majors. Yeah. And we're going to go for the championship. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, like, also I'm noticing that where capitalism has basically destroyed professional sports with the free agency in this country. And in, in the Premier League, there's no salary cap at all. Right. If you can afford a player, you just buy them. All right, they're setting this to, so I want to clear this up. It was a UNICEF game for soccer aid, England versus the rest of the world. Harrelson played for the rest of the world, charity match but a big fucking deal in front of 70,000 people. Oh, that's good. Good yeah. for him. Yeah. 
Uh, so when I saw the footage that he showed on Letterman as a clip, they showed the rest of the team going as nuts as when they... Mm. It's so hard to score a goal, and you can't believe it. If you score a yeah, goal... Yeah, because on those penalty kicks especially, you've got a professional uh, goalie. Penalty kick's about a 90-percenter, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's like taking a free throw shot. <laughs> There's no way you should miss a penalty kick. Really? No way. <laughs> if you're, like, when, you get to, when it gets down to like, World what Cup... What about an actor? That's really good. <laughs> but if you're in a World Cup... Yes, no, he's not a then World Cup. There's a lot of pressure. You can see guys missing. You know, when there's five guys and, like, two of them miss, that's right. understandable. Right. Three out of five, that's pretty, you know, not unusual. Uh, but if you're in a regular game and you got a penalty kick coming, you gotta, you got to put it in there, man. That's 80% or 90%. Or that's, you shouldn't be missing those. It's like a... Uh, like, people watch... Extra point. On. People watch footage of the, other, of the goalkeeper to see if he favors his right or his left, and the goalkeepers watch footage of... Everybody on the team to see during penalty kick if they favor the right or the left, up corner, this corner, that corner, the bottom. They shoot that. I mean, it's like I know that you know that I know that he knows. It's mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. when you get up there. But if you hit it hard enough and get it into the corner, it's no fucking way you should miss a penalty kick. Yeah. I get mad. You should. Ne- I'm saying as an owner, you should never ever. <laughs> there's no excuse for it. But only people get nervous. It's it is still hard to do. Like a, you say that you should never miss, but then you you get a free throw line. Right. Games on the line, yeah. you miss a. Th- it's understandable that you would miss a free throw. Yeah, when it's a, when in the gym, hundred in a row or whatever. Right. But in the game, you're like, oh shit! Everybody's yelling. There's all the <laughs> man. It's me. I'm the goat or the hero. Right. You know, bad alcohol going through. So yeah, you could miss one. That's but, a different. Yeah, and then you know the, the goal is like if you're a goal, next time you get a chance, stand in front of a goal as a, and pretend you're a goalkeeper and see how much. There's no area way. you have to cover. What is it, 45 feet? It's, it's crazy. tough, man. It's a lot. It's a big goal. You know, eight feet, and you got to be like. Eight feet either way? I think it's eight feet all the way around, but you're only so tall, and you know, you got to reach out, and people are hitting it in the corner, and you got to like. The whole goal is only eight feet wide. No, no, like no, 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 no. eight feet up. You know tall, I mean? tall, yeah. tall, tall. Right. And you got to be, you know, hitting the corner. What is the width? I can't remember. Anybody know the width? I just Google it. Yeah, yeah. If we only had some kind of magic electronic machine. Oh, yeah, that we could. Um, all right, sir. I want you to start gearing up your Larry King game. I want okay. you to start thinking in terms of your Larry King game. I'm going to go over the rules again. Okay. I'm looking for a bad Larry King impression. All the pressure's off. That's me. Yep. <laughs> gotcha. Takes all the pressure Check. off. Check. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other two would be just as easy. Uh, it's that too much information from Larry. And it's Larry King, so you, again, you can go back sure. to prehistoric times. Sure. Talk about one of his 74 wives. Sure. Right? It's all about Larry. And he's sharing it right before he goes to the phones. It's like one of those King's things. That he decides to share, and then if the name of the city is funny sounding, it's helpful. I'm going to buy you a little time by asking you a question from Stephen Rankin. Is there a genre or field in the entertainment industry that you haven't done that you would still like to try? Um, long form improv. Yeah? I'm learning it now. That's yeah. the next one? Yeah, I want to learn how to do long form improv. It's different. The Who's Line is short form. It's a lot of short games and stuff. And long form, you just get one suggestion and you just go. Right. Or not even a You don't even need a suggestion. Just two people can just start talking and then they're gone. And a right. half hour later, an hour later, they're still going. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's a whole other skill. Like a Who's Line game, you get a suggestion from the audience. Everybody knows their place, their position, what they're going to do. And then you only have to do a couple minutes. Go for five the minutes. Go for the laugh. Boom, boom, boom. And long form, you're going for the laugh, too. But you have to discover all that. Storytelling. Yourself, yeah. By what the other person says and how they're acting. And they have to discover from your acting. So it's like all this creative spark going back and forth. You know? Yeah. Uh, it's, re- it's like, to me, it's magical. And I want to learn how to do that. But there's a lot of guys in L.A. Is like the, L.A. is like the best place in the world for all these people. Like, this is where they all come to. Where they all end up. So you can see some fantastic improv out here. And I'm like, no, I, should, I want to learn how to do that. I think we have to go to UCB Wednesday. Yeah, we'll go Wednesday night. Drew was saying there's a big thing, UCB Wednesday. Wednesday night at 11, go see Heather and Miles. Yeah, the cage match. That they're they're great. Insane. Heather and Miles are insane, talented. yeah. Right. Yeah. And your answer is 24 feet wide. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Eight Thank feet by 24 much. feet. Eight by 24? That's a lot of area That's to cover. Of. That's too fucking much for one man. Yeah. <laughs> when the guy's standing in front of you. Yeah. And the, it, the ball goes 80 miles an hour. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's literally how fast it goes. It's like a, it's like a fastball pitch, or it's like a, not a fastball pitch and go ninety, but it's like a good hard, you know, pitch from a major league pitcher. And you have to guess like which side, 
And you, you know, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to be on your line and not come off the line. If you come off the line, it's supposed to be a retake or you get a penalty or some, uh, you're not supposed to do it. Right. And, uh, but goalkeepers do it all the time. Sure. <laughs> you have to only be able to go side to side at first and get rid of it, but they always take a step up. And you'll see guys like the referee just doesn't call it. Right. It's like one of those. It's like one of those things where there's a holding on every single offensive yeah. play. Yeah, and then one time the, they decide the to call it. Right. Yeah, like, now you're going to call it. Yeah. I've been doing this whole game, and now you're going to call it. Uh, what, do, can you tell us, I mean, you can, I would think, this team that you're... The Seattle Sounders? Is that who it is? Yeah. We're gonna, we have Sports Business Journal named us the Sports Franchise of the Year last year. Excuse me? Yeah. Sports Franchise of the Year? Yeah, Sports Business Journal. Covering all sports. Yeah, we beat out the uh, Yankees, the Dallas Mavericks, uh, everybody. The uh, criteria being... Best run, fan, like every, I don't know what their criteria is, but the, we, Everything. we beat everybody, yeah. We're, it's really a great franchise. Joe Roth is the majority owner. From the motion picture business, yes. Joe Roth? Yes, And um, I'm, I'm the minority, minority owner, celebrity face. Uh-huh. And uh, it's, uh, Joe Roth, Adrian Hanauer, who's our general manager, the two big owners, and Vulcan Sports, uh, uh, who own the Seattle Seahawks. The Seahawks are our partners up there. We play at the... CenturyLink Field, uh, just we got renamed last year, CenturyLink, where the Seahawks play. We got 38,000 a game last year. We're going to get close to 40,000 a game this year. And on the many list of achievements we've gone through. It's pretty cool. That's got to be way the fuck up there. It's great. And I'm like a fan with benefits. I don't really have to go to the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. And the, the thing we do up there that nobody else does is we let the fans, Joe, you know, the end of this year is going to be our first vote. So we're in our fourth year right now. Uh, but the, we let the fans vote out the general manager every four years if they don't like the job he's doing. Vote him out? Yeah. Uh, we hire the general manager. We can fire the general manager anytime we want. Of course. The ownership can for whatever reason, just like a normal job, like a normal general manager. But the fans always have in their back, like the season ticket holders, I should say, always have in their back pocket uh, this veto power to go like, no, this is not the guy we want. Wow. And get rid of him. And you can do it every four years. We have we have a vote no matter what. But if like uh, you know you're the general manager and the fans vote you out, and then we hire your brother who thinks exactly the same like you, does the same things you do. Like any year they want, they can get twenty percent of the other season ticket holders to sign a petition. We can have a vote that year. Wow. So technically, any year they want, if they get mad enough, they can get rid of our general manager for us. Who came up? I mean, is this an experimental thing that's worked in other countries? What yeah, they do it at Real Madrid and at Barcelona. But at Real, Real Madrid and Barcelona, um, they have a vote every four years on the guy that runs the whole club. Jesus. So it'd be like voting Mark Cuban out of that. that it'd be like that. <laughs> or if, like, because the teams are worth that much money. Right. So it'd be like if you had a billion dollars and you said, you know, I like the Dallas Mavericks. I think I want to run them. You would put, just like you could do at Real Madrid, you could say, I want to put 15% of the, of the team in a bank account. So if they make money, I make money. If they lose money, I lose money. But I have to gather that money. So you have to have like $80 million together if you're going to do Real Madrid, let's say. Put it in a bank. And then I'll use the American version of Dallas Mavericks. And you say, hey, this year, uh, vote Mark Cuban out and vote me in. I'll run the Dallas Mavericks. I'll do a much better job than he was. I won't argue with the refs. I'm going to bring in this player, that player. I'll be the, you know, I'll bring you a championship. Holy shit! For sure. Right. I got LeBron's going to come. Well, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And if all the season ticket holders in Dallas that that are, that are members of the Dallas Mavericks, you know, members association, whatever they call it, if they go, you know what, this Pollock guy. <laughs> he runs a hell of a campaign. He runs a hell of a campaign. Yeah. I believe he's going to do way better than Mark Cuban. I like Pollock. And then, See ya. And then Mark Cuban's out, and then you're running the Dallas Mavericks. <laughs> wow. And you're, so when you hire... That's what, they, that's what they do at Real Madrid and right. Barcelona. So you, you and I... So I, I heard that idea, and I wanted to bring it to the America. That's and why this I wanted, is the first year? Yes, yeah, we're going to have our first vote. But we can't have the vote out, the because of the MLS structure, they can't really vote out the owners, the person that runs the team. But we can have them vote out the general manager, and it really like, marries us to the fans and make right. us, makes us accountable to the fans all the time. That's pretty great. Yeah, it's good. Every sports team should have it. I agree. Yeah. Starting with the Mavericks. Yeah. Um, well, it wouldn't be Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban could right. say, no, no. if you don't like my general manager, GM. get yeah. rid of him. We'll have right. somebody else run the team. Yeah. But we, you know, we, we hire and fire normally. It's just all the same, but just the fans always have that in their back pocket. They can always go, you know what? No. This guy's, forget it. And I always use Matt Millen of the Detroit Lions, sorry, Matt, as my example, because he was fans were so unhappy with him for so long in Detroit and right. nobody liked him. And there Nobody he stayed. Him, but the owner never 
He didn't care. Right. They're making money. And then that makes the fans feel like they don't give a shit about us. They just want right. our money. Right. Yeah. Which also happens. You know what I've always said from the beginning? I'm sorry it took 141 of these. But the show needs to be entertaining and educational. You've got to learn something every fucking week about something that not everyone knows. How many? Kenny? <laughs> um, it's time for Larry King again. Okay. Yeah. There's your camera. When you're ready. Uh, bad Larry King impression. A little uh, too much information moment. And then go to the phones. Nineteen fifty-two, Marilyn Monroe snapped my spine in two. Repaired in nineteen sixty-eight, Kingman, Arizona. <laughs> You're on Larry King. Kingman, Arizona. I like. <laughs> I like it all. Oh man, long overdue. Thank you very, very thanks, much. Thanks, brother. Honestly. Thanks for all the good advice when I started out. Yeah. Well, listen. Thanks for helping me on the book. <laughs> uh, um, sit there uncomfortably for thirty seconds while I wrap things up, if okay. you don't mind. Sure. Uh, thank you uh, all. He thanks you all for uh, joining us once again next week for our third year anniversary. I guess uh, I probably should have mentioned that to the crew that next year, uh, Sunday will in fact be our third year anniversary. The fantastic Ed Begley Jr., the first um, electric car in this country driven by that man, so much so that it, it was, uh, he, I think he played himself on The Simpsons talking about it, didn't he? <laughs> didn't he? Yeah, so he was driving, driving, I think, a solar-powered car, and then the sun went down, and he couldn't go anywhere. Yeah, and he stopped. I guess what it was. Uh, it kind of comes full circle, because I was, wow, in many ways, I just realized, I was performing at uh, a Sw Underground at Swanee's. Mm -hmm. Remember Swanee's Underground in Seattle? He had mm -hmm. a, a, a former catcher of the, um, the Mariners had a bar, Swanee's, and the under Comedy Underground was in the basement of this place. And I was performing there when Ed Begley Jr. came to town. He was already on St. Elsewhere and saw me there and said, well, if you're ever in L.A., you know, and he was the first real celebrity in show business who said, well, if you're ever in L.A., and showed me around and, and um, gave me advice. So it's kind of full circle fantastic that he's our guest on the third anniversary. I'm very excited about that. Check the... Um, the calendar for upcoming shows. Jason Antoon, I want to thank you. Sam Levine was very upset about you sitting in for him today. I'm sure you saw that on Twitter. Sure, he's happy doing a pilot. But he's shooting I'm a not. pilot in the Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> so I see what you're saying. He's going to have a mustache. Yeah. See? There. Oh, the advice is falling from tree. I'm going to say, Drew, you gave me advice. <laughs> Put on that mustache. <laughs> and he's had that porn stash ever since. Uh, thanks to Dr. Chen and Jamie as well. And uh, Josh and Justin and J-Mac that are in the outer walls. Where was uh, Adam today? No, Adam? Intern Adam? Midterms. Midterms, gotcha. Uh, Lane Ewing, our fabulous social media. Big and, show. Uh, you don't want to miss your midterms. No, you don't want to miss the midterms. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why you got to have more than one intern. <laughs> um, and uh, Samantha Ward, of course, for the wonderful makeup job. Um, yeah, check the local listings. And I got to say it again, if you don't mind. Please go to, uh, to the iTunes. Give us a review. Let us know what you think of the show. Nice reviews is not enough. Yeah, no, it's not enough. It's really not. <laughs> it's really not enough. And then check out Talk and Walk on you son of a bitch. Uh, thank you all, and uh, very much for contributing and being a part of the show. We do actually do appreciate it very much. Only give us a review if you're going to hit the maximum number of stars. By the way. <laughs> yeah. If you don't like the show, go fuck. Don't fucking bother. Fuck <laughs> your balls. Yeah. Nobody gives a shit. Uh, after three years, I don't yeah. need it. Yeah. Just uh, shut the fuck up if you don't like it. But if you like it, just <laughs> click five stars and whatever. You know. <laughs> Truer words never spoken. <laughs> and on that, I say to you once again, as always. Get out of my face.